My guests today are Steve Mildenhall and John Major. Steve is head of analytics at Qualrisk, an insurance consulting firm, formerly assistant professor of actuarial science at St. John's University, and before that, CEO of analytics at Aon. This is Steve's fifth appearance on this show. John is principal at Major Analytics and the former director of actuarial research at Guy Carpenter, and this is his first time on this podcast. Steve and John have written a magisterial new book called Pricing Insurance Risk Theory and Practice, which we'll be using to trace the past, present, and future of that topic today. And I'm very excited to have you on the show. Welcome. Glad to be, to be here. First question. So let's say you're wildly successful with this book and all actuaries master this material. How will insurance customers be better off at the end of that process than they were when you both started your careers, let's say kind of in around 1990? Well, I don't know if 1990 is the right anchor point for that, because, uh, <laughs> you know, this was before Hurricane Andrew, before the Northridge earthquake. And uh, I think it's fair to say that back then, catastrophe risk was severely underpriced. So yep. customers were doing pretty well back then. Yeah. You want to go forward to something like 2010. You know, now you're in a situation where it's, you know, you have cat modeling, the stuff came out of the laboratory and it's commercialized and you have a pretty good consensus, for for better or worse, as to what cat risk looks like. You can at least take a view of it. There's uncertainties involved, of course, but uh, you can take a view on, on your loss cost and then seriously address the question of the risk load, the risk margin, and uh, that's what our book is about. It's about but you might, getting to the risk margin. You might margin. say, though, that the customers thought they were better off, but they weren't, right? I mean, we're in the world of unusual things in insurance. And so the customers all thought they're getting a pretty good deal, but the ones they got their insurance companies went insolvent after Andrew probably realized after the fact that they weren't. Steve, what do you think? Yeah. So I, I was, I was going to begin by saying that I hope, uh, before we get to the customers, actuaries will be better off because I think <laughs> one of our motivations in writing this book was that the current exam syllabus and the education, the preparation we give to new fellows and associates, is not great in this area. I mean, there's some really good papers on the syllabus, but they're very much from the sort of developmental phase rather than a sort of clean, crisp presentation of a, an established uh, theory. So partly we, we just hope that actuaries have a more productive time um, and a sort of cleaner set of conversations when they're discussing these topics with, uh, with management and their employees. Uh, in terms of um, customers, I guess I'd look at it maybe sort of step back a bit, right? I, I think that the idea of managing risk through an insurance pool, so pooling risk, taking the advantage of diversification, is kind of truly one of the five great ideas of mankind, right? I'm going to put it yep. right up this with the wheel and fire, EM and... Uh, money and money. Yeah, right. right. D divisional labor, that type of thing. Right? Yep. This is miraculous I agree. Thing. And in order for that to function you have to bring together a group of people who are strangers to one another. And so it's really important that the pool treats the, the members fairly. It needs to Fairness. treat them fairly. It needs to be seen to treat them fairly, and it needs to sort of demonstrably treat them fairly, right? And if you look at a lot of the infrastructure we have set up around insurance, regulation, uh, rating agencies, and so forth, let's make sure we actually uh, back our promises up, we pay our claims, um, on the loss cost side, there's a lot of work around, you know, disparate income, unfair discrimination, all that type of thing. Um, what we're filling in with this book is the profit component piece of that, right? We are, this, this book is really about how do you think of fairly allocating the, that cost of running the capital side of your insurance pool? And so, yeah, I would see this, this work as, as part of a sort of ongoing efforts to ensure that the risk-bearing function of insurance pools operate as effectively as possible. And as John has, has brought out, it really is all about the cat risk, right? I mean, that is, you know, the, the margins on most lines of business, as you know, are maybe sort of 5 to 10% of the expected loss, whereas the margins on cat business by, you know, earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, the, the really big events, is it's a multiple of the expected so it's two or three, five hundred percent of expected loss. So it's really, really important. And it tends to, if that part of the market fails, the whole thing gums up, as we, we saw after Andrew, we saw after Northridge, we saw 2006. You know, I'm, I'm hearing that this, this year-end renewal is going to be pretty pretty interesting as well. 
So I, I think that the way customers are going to benefit is not necessarily they're going to get what they regard as cheaper for prices, but they're going to get fairer prices and they're going to be able to buy insurance in a market that operates as effectively as possible and provides as broader set of coverages to them as possible. So I'm very happy. I like I like that answer, Steve. And I think that in the first part, I was a little worried there because uh, I I, um, I think you would be doing yourself both a disservice uh, by not connecting it to what the because let's face it, actuaries do serve customers in a abstracted kind of sense or distant sense. There's a few layers of people in between actuaries and customers. Some might say that's a good idea, but there they there there is a purpose is a customer serving purpose to the actuary's work. And I think a lot of ways of this uh, phenomenal book, phenomenal book, uh, which is definitely a book for actuaries. So not everybody listening to this podcast will want to buy this book, but they can all benefit from the concepts that we're gonna be discussing today. And I think that actuaries often have, there it is, a probably a, sometimes a hard time connecting the work they do to the value to the original customers. I think you did a really good job there, Steve, of talking about how they, how the concept of a stable insurance industry is very much what you guys are supporting and um, advancing with this work. But I have a question then, which sort of follows on from this concept. How do you describe to people what you do? If somebody off the street, right, friend of a friend shows up, oh, hey, what do you do for a living? Uh, it, uh, what do you say? <laughs> <laughs> I say I'm retired. <laughs> okay, what did you say 10 years ago, Steve? You can't get away with that, not today. <laughs> It's about, so everyone will say risk return, right? You hear, you, you, you go and look at your mutual funds and you're deciding where to invest. You hear this expression, risk return all over the place, higher risk, higher return. Well, what this book is about is how much, quantify it. How do you quantify and measure the risk, which is a really slippery character, right? Risk is a very nuanced, multidimensional thing. It's hard to pin it down to one number. So how do you characterize the risk and then you know, you can measure the return, that's generally easier, not necessarily always completely easy, but how are you relating the return to however you've decided to, to measure the risk? So it's all about sort of quantifying, what does it mean when I say higher risk mean, you know, requires a higher return? John? Yeah, the, the, the question of risk versus value has been something I've been chasing for years and years and years. And, I was working for a reinsurance broker in the, the last part of my career, and of course, uh, you know, we're trying to make deals uh, for reinsurance. And so the, the natural question is, well, what is the value of reinsurance? Uh, and you know what? Nobody had a really good answer to that, and, and it's amazing that they didn't. Uh, and it was also uh, it's one of these situations where problems worthy of attack prove their worth by fighting back. Uh, <laughs> a lot of really brilliant people over the years, I've been trying to tackle this question uh, with varying degrees of success. And so I think what, what we did in this book here is kind of filtered a heck of a lot of really good research done by a lot of people and distilled down the parts that worked and saw and, and showcased how they all fit together into this answer. Uh, and it's not like we did a lot of original research uh, in this particular book, I mean, we did we did our own original research in the years past, you know, contributing our our little streams to the rivers of research. But uh, but in the book, we we pulled together this incredible body of research that had been pretty opaque to the people who need to understand it, to to the actuaries, to the working actuaries. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd add to that. So I always felt like when I was working, there's a lot of economists and finance guys you know, writing papers and what have you. And in, insurance is such an obvious thing to, for them to study because it's sort of pure risk. Um, there's got to be a good answer to this out there. It's just a matter of, you know, finding it and understanding it. And, you know, if I had to, like, identify one paper that, that I think has sort of the most interesting and the most important answers that sort of we, you know, explore in the book, it was written in the year 2000. And I probably first started looking at it and reading it and trying to understand it in, you know, fairly soon thereafter. And I remember, you know, I would keep going back to it over and over again because it was a fairly, it was a, you know, math paper, basically. It wasn't, it wasn't a very, very you know, easy to read paper. Um, 
And sure enough, it turns out when, when I finally you know, had the time to, to dig through and understand what it was saying, it has the answers. And it has, you know, it has the answer for, to the, the age-old problem of, of, you know, when you do a, a marginal calculation, you have what's described as the ordering problem, right? Do I think of, the, it seems like the allocation of uh, costs you get depends on what order you bring your risks into the portfolio, one, which is obviously a bit of a problem. Um, and it turns out the, the reason for that is you're trying to differentiate. When you do marginal, you're really talking about slopes, right? You're trying to differentiate a function that's got a cusp. So it matters whether you approach it from the left or the right. You'll get a different slope. It was right there in this paper, and it not only you know identifies that, identifies that if, if that isn't the case, you don't have that problem, and it gives sort of a really nice sort of wrap-up answer to to unifying two ways of looking at risk measure, a marginal way and um, a risk-adjusted probability way that sort of seem to be different in a lot of cases, but actually are the same, they give you the same answer, provided you have the right underlying assumptions. And that was just a, a joyous, you know, discover, it wasn't a discovery, it was a joyous, you know, learning out of, out of the literature once I finally understood what it was saying. So I, I am going to... Let me, uh, let me amplify it, let me amplify on that, sure. okay? So, so here, it, here it is in a nutshell. There's the answer sitting out there amid a thousand other papers, amid hundreds of other papers taking ridiculous, you know, continuous time option pricing models uh, approach to insurance pricing. And, and there's the answer out there. And it takes Steve Mildenhall, above average intelligence among the actuaries, 20 years to figure out what's really going on here. So it's like it's like panning for gold. You know, you know it's out there, but you know it takes a lot of time to find it. Yeah, I mean, uh, so a few thoughts. One, we're going to come to Freddie Delbin's paper, um, or Delbin. I'm not sure how you pronounce his name. Only seen it written up to now. Um, I, I want to really get into that because uh, I did pull it up during my preparation for the show, and I had a look and didn't get very far. Um, in one evening after putting my kids to bed, <laughs> which is usually when I do research for this podcast, it's not a good time to be reading a very remarkably dense um, mathematical uh, paper by by some guy in some university in Switzerland. Um, but we're not going to do that yet. So the 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 thing that I want to pull out of that, and I'm going to hold you guys to this question of what how, what you tell people at a dinner party you do for a living. Uh, but the interesting theme that came out of that you know those comments there was. Uh, Weirdly, actuaries aren't even really sure what they're doing or sort of how they're doing it, right? Or hadn't been for a long time, you know, because we have a, a lot of the sort of insight into how actually what we do works or how it should work um, buried in a paper that was written not that long ago. And actuaries have been around for quite a long time. And so to me, it's like I felt this a lot as well, where it's actually quite, un, uh, you know, we don't people in the insurance industry generally don't fully understand kind of why what we do matters for people uh, and how it does, because it really does. Uh, but we're sort of all kind of part of this industry that just sort of works. Uh, and we don't have a lot of kind of meta insight into it. So, so I, I would, would respond there that I think for many years, it didn't matter, right? So if you go back and you look at how risk loads were added into insurance prices, particularly in the US, um, there was this thing called the commissioner's decision that I think happened in the 20s or the early 30s, and it basically said, underwriting margin of 5%, that's it, right, we're done. And everyone just was happy, on, and they went on their way, and they loaded that in. And there wasn't a massive variation across lines of business. I think fire had a conflagration, a cat load in, the, in, in you know, olden times meant more a, a, like the Chicago fire, right, a massive fire in a city. That's what people worried about. And you got an extra point or two for that. But it was basically five points across the board, and it wasn't sort of a whole lot of, of, of variation. As John said, the sort of Andrew was such an important event for the industry because it was like, whoa, all of a sudden we've got, yo, know, State Farm Fire and Casualty just lost every penny it made since inception in 1935 or whenever they lost in Andrew, right? A very large, very old, established um homeowners insurance company. This was a complete game changer. And mm. you, it, you know, what went with that sort of massive increase in risk was a massive increase in risk loads. And so all of a sudden, rather than talking about whether is it 
four percent or six percent, which you know probably deserves a three-page paper because it's like I don't care. This <laughs> is a bit of a yawn. You now now you're talking about buying reinsurance that has a load of is it two x, three x, or five x, right? And it's a, it's a much bigger deal. So I think it's it's you know there's that sort of modern era that starts with camp modeling and, and what have you. I think it sort of started you know it was thirty years ago this year, right? That uh, that Andrew happened. I think it's a bit unfair to sort of characterize this as, as blundering along. It, it just sort of wasn't an issue until these these cats started happening. Hmm. John, anything to add to that? There were, uh, you know, and you, you start there and you look at how people have been studying it and there's been a lot of different directions and uh, a lot of drift and a lot of blind alleys. And we can spend a lot of time talking about the blind alleys. Don't want to get into that quite yet. Uh, so, yeah. The, no, all right. So that that's to tagging along what Steve just said. Now, you want to talk about what what I do for a living? You know, what actuaries do for a living? Let, you know, that's like asking what engineers do for a living. It's it's uh, there's quite a variety there, you know. Uh, this this particular actuary, I'm not even sure I've been acting as an actuary. I've been doing research. I've been trying to figure out consistent, uh, sensible models for how this little corner of the financial world works. Uh. Figuring out what actually we should be doing. Um, you know, your point, Steve, there uh, about the history, that's, you know, brilliant point, exactly where I wanted to go. Uh, the My thought, you know, tell me what you think about this. Yes, Hurricane Andrew obliterated, uh, you know, Florida insurance companies, or 26 of them or something crazy like that that went out of business, right? And that was Two years a, a, later, the Northridge earthquake. And then Northridge. 18 months, 18 months or 14, not less, well less than two years. Yeah, that, that is pretty amazing one-two punch to the industry to wake folks up. But my thought there is these are, these matter as a, as a, it's a, it's a question of scale relative to the industry, I think. I mean, relative to expectations of the industry, but also relative to the industry as well. Because I think like if you go back, I don't know, 300 years, 500 years, 10,000 years, whatever it is, whenever kind of the concepts of insurance are kind of permanent, uh, I think, part of social culture, to, I think, to one of your original points there, Steve, um, the scale of a disaster uh, is, and they've always been very large, and the shock of how to handle, or so the shock of a disaster and how to handle it afterwards um, is, is in some way the challenge of that is proportional to the resources you have available, right? So what I mean by that is like in the 17th or 18th century or 19th century, large fires in a city would have been uh, equivalent to an Andrew. Like we will have had events like this in history, which today might not be quite, I mean, I don't know if the whole city burned down, I guess that would be bad no matter where you're from, no matter who, no matter who you are. Um, but I would think that like, because the, you know, the financial resources available to insurance companies in yesteryear were smaller, the industry is way smaller. There was no auto liability for one thing, which is a huge, huge proportion of the insurance industry. And so you had this, like a smaller kind of collective pool of capital to fund risk. You probably would have had Andrew style, you know, assaults on the industry's capital base in the past. Um, but we just didn't have the ability to do anything about that or think scientifically about how to handle it, right? Is, is this, what do you guys think about this concept that Andrew is sort of the next in the line uh, of, of a lot of disasters that have struck the insurance industry, um, but now we suddenly had the tools to kind of think through it, you know, think it through more carefully. Yeah, I mean, the timing of Andrew relative to cap models. So I think the early cap models came out sort of late 80s, right? So there were cap models there, but I think they were largely not believed. Yeah, they were ignored. Right? They, yes. were, they were ignored. And, yo, you, so you, you had the other big story out of um, Andrew was um, Prupac, right? Prudential Property and Casualty Company of America that also blew up completely, lost uh, 100% of its surplus there. And that was a, a carrier that largely wrote risks in the Northeast. Well, an upper market kind of book, they all had summer homes in Florida. <laughs> yeah. And they, so they thought they had a Northeast exposure. They had a Florida exposure that they weren't really tracking quite as carefully, or maybe, maybe they you know, were ignoring the numbers, but it was, a, it was a giant shock. Their market share loss was very concentrated around where New Yorkers went to retire in Florida, which was happened to be, you know, where, where Andrew uh, 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 hit. And, and so 
that was a fact that, yo, know, as soon as that happened, we all realized, well, we could have known of that ahead of time. Right? Yeah. And so we went from, you know, Andrew was the greatest sales tool for the cap modeling firms imaginable, right? Hey, I told you so. I was telling you so. It actually happened. You know, here it is. And it took, you know, it, it probably took five plus years because you, you had FHCF happen, right? Then you had Northridge, you had CEA, you had a lot of dislocation, and you had a sort of a complete transformation in the financing of insurance, right? Cap bonds came along, the ability to do a startup, uh, standalone, Bermuda reinsurer came along. There was an a, amazing series of innovations that happened kind of off the back of that. And a big part of that was the ability to measure risk, right? To be, to be able to come up with PMLs, to, to, de to develop this language that everyone kind of used interchangeably. Rating agencies, regulators used it, you know, cedents to reinsurers used it, reinsurers used it, investors used it. Everybody was speaking the same language and it enabled the market to take place because people could communicate with one another, right? So I, I could think about how much capital I need, I could think about returns, think about how much reinsurance I need to buy. So it was a, it was a wonderful sort of coming together of, of the ingredients you needed to, to sort of really move risk management forward. So I want to just sort of inter interject here and um, just for pe people who might not be reinsurance actuaries uh, listening to this, which we hope they will, uh, cat models were or vendor models invented in now uh, the 70s 1960s. or 1960s. Let me tell 60s. you the history of cat okay. modeling. Okay, let, let, I, I will ask you to do that, John. Let me just sort of finish one more thought. I had an interview with Ted Blanche on this show uh, a couple of years, several years ago, where he described in a part of a company which was much lauded as an early adopter and promoter of cat models, E.W. Blanche at the time, and he said it was the biggest disaster, that being the investment into cat models in the 80s. He's like, it was, he's like I, was, I hated it. He's like, we was spending all this money on this stuff and nobody cared about it, and, and it was just a pointless flushing money down the toilet, and then, bang, the catastrophes happen, and now suddenly people have this desire, just as you're saying, Steve, to bought, to pay money to a software company to tell them what's the risk of a hurricane striking my portfolio. Um, remarkable. There's a lot to how the um, a lot about human psychology wrapped up in that story. Um, but John, please do tell us cat models. Doctor Don Friedman of the Travelers. He was a geophysicist and joined the Travelers in the '60s. And he was the first one to do portfolio risk assessment. Okay, the, you know, the geophysicists had been doing point risk assessment for some years, but he's the first one who said, okay, well, what if you have a whole portfolio of these things? What does that look like? And so in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, he was churning out these studies internally for the travelers. He was churning out papers for the scientific community. He invented cat modeling. And it was, Karen Clark came to visit him and to learn, and she took a lot of this and developed it herself and commercialized it and made it into something that people would be willing to pay money for, something that Dr. Friedman really didn't care about at the time. He was a salaried employee. When, when she became successful, the, the, this whole group, this was in the Travelers, the corporate research area in the Travelers, uh, they looked around and said, you know, we could have been doing this, so let's let's do it. And they started their own little natural hazards research services, uh, selling the same kind of services. Uh, and Guy Carpenter was their biggest customer. Hmm. And long story short, that's how I ended up at Guy Carpenter. Amazing. Um, quite a lot there about entrepreneurship, right? You have, and I, I, I occasionally work with insurance tech startups, and many and many a time you you come across the potential criticism of them. Well, what if the biggest insurance companies try to, you know, stomp you out? And the answer is, well, they might come up with the right ideas, but that filtering through a big organization to turn it into a commercializable product, virtually impossible, I will say. And so it takes a startup like Karen did with AIR. Uh, it back then to uh, and, and listen. I'm not. She had some lean years at the beginning there to Ted Blanche's story about how it just wasn't working. because nobody wanted it. So people in the travelers are probably folding their arms, being like, "Well, got away with that one. We didn't have to do anything there." And then until suddenly, it was a tremendously good idea. So if you guys could cast your mind back for me to the pre-Andrew world, um, what what did actuaries do in these lines of business? You know, Steve, you're saying that there was no profit load. They must have, I mean, there must have been something. It, it was, it was 5%. So I'll have to okay. hand this one over to John. 
Because okay. I cannot pass my mind back to pre-Andrew because I started in the industry on uh, June, I think, the 29th, 1992. So my pre-Andrew <laughs> experience was, was about six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Are you spring chicken, you, Steve? Yeah. Okay, John, tell me what were actuaries doing back then? Uh, experience studies. Okay. You, you know, just look at what happened and you know, true it up and project it forward. So you one could argue maybe that cat models themselves are a version of experience studies, right? So they look at hurricanes in history. Steve, don't like that one. Um, okay, you could argue that, right? But what I would counter with or add, maybe it's an, it's an addition, is that unlike any other line of business, I could go away and I could build a model that would probably be the right order of magnitude answer with no insurance data. Because I, I can generate all the events for sure with no insurance data because it's got nothing to do with it, right? Meteorology, seismology. So I can develop the events and then I can put a house in a wind tunnel and I can blow the roof off of what have you and I can do some studies to come up with some damage codes. So I think yep. it's, a, it's a really unique thing about catastrophe risk is that actually I can get quite a long way to pricing it with no experience. I don't believe you could do that with personal order. I don't believe you could build a model that would say, oh, I've got all these cars flying around and, and you know, what is, when are they going to collide with one another? I don't think you could do that sort of cerebrally the way you can do it for count models. And so maybe, if you had enough, to... maybe if you had enough Google location data. Maybe, but even then it's not clear that you could really. I, I don't know that you get, I don't, you couldn't, I don't think you could get an estimate of frequency. We know what the frequency of hurricanes is pretty well, right? We've got yep. that. We've got 150 years. I don't need any insurance data for that. I don't think you could guess that BI frequency would be 3%, 5%, 2%, whatever it is. Right. Touché. Th those are purely social phenomena, right? They're just humans interacting with killer machines called <laughs> automobiles, um, you know, walking around with AK-47s, and once in a while one goes off by accident, you know, when you're driving your car around. Um uh, and, you know, one of the things I did want to actually ask you guys about, we see to keep hitting it over and over again, so we might as well talk about it explicitly. Your book doesn't cover liability business, really. And I, I want to actually push back against that a little bit because I was thinking about how to, maybe you could adapt some of the ideas. Maybe you have thoughts. But, I mean, it is, you know, really very much about catastrophe-oriented reinsurance. And property cap is not the only kind of catastrophe. You're going to have catastrophes in other lines of business as well. But um, that seems to be kind of the core call it observation about the world that this has become a very important part of the insurance industry. And so this book is designed to price it. Well, look, the book says if you have a probabilistic model of your losses, then here's what you want to do with it. Okay. Okay. So if you want to go ahead and build yourself a, a liability model that you believe in, go ahead and use our book to get the risk load. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it, you can – price a multi-line, you can do the allocations. I think the difference is, is that the confidence you'll have in your statistical model for the liability lines will be lower than what you have on the property side. Because typically, and we've probably all worked with people doing you know, the, the capital models and the internal simulation models, um, on the property side, you've run it through this cap model, and if you stacked up all the research, it probably beats you know, halfway to the moon or something. There's a lot of papers, a lot of scientists. And then you think about, well, how did I calibrate that number for, you know, my GL distribution? Well, and actually when, oh, I think the loss ratio is about 68, the CV is 25%, and I'm plugging in a log normal. Well, that's not going to give you quite, and, and you got the problem of how you glue it all together with the correlation, right? So it's, there's some information there, and you can look at the tails and what have you, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's actually a lot of insurance information if you go back. I've done a ton of work with that. But it's not really the same kind and quality as uh, the information you've got underlying cat models. But the so, methodology is completely agnostic to line. It just it takes as right. input a multivariate distribution and it pops out allocations for you. Yeah, you are. I mean, it is quite a general approach. Uh, uh, all the examples are catastrophe examples in the book. Because I mean, I don't mean that as a criticism. Because that's just the best application for the methods, right? Yeah. I mean, by a long way. And and it's also the problem that certainly I saw everybody struggling with, right? I never went in and talked to management and had them say, oh, I'm really struggling with deciding whether, you know, I do I like GL or commercial law? I mean, maybe yeah. they don't like MedMal and some people have, you know, convictions against work comp or whatever, but the, the discussion around 
how do I balance cat against everything else? I would say is almost omnipresent, right? And it's a, it's a giant debate going on in the market right now. You can listen to quarterly conference calls and you've got CEO, some CEOs saying, we're pulling back, we don't like it, we don't like the risk re- reward on it. And you've got other CEOs saying, no, we think, you know, we, we, we trust the science, we know what we're doing, we're experts, we're, we're going to continue to grow. So you can see that debate, like, playing out real time. And it is, it's a real debate and there's, you know, different points of view. And so it's just because the risk loads are so material. That's, that's why the cat space is so important here. What are so uh, I can't help but jump on that one. I have to write a note for myself to come back to this thread. But what are they disagreeing on, those CEOs? I think fundamentally. Right. So, so when you listen to CEOs talk about volatility, um, often they're really talking about realized volatility. They've had yep. some losses, and they and in that situation, it becomes very hard to disentangle the sort of potential for loss, the fact you've actually just had some loss, and underpricing. Because there's nothing that makes it more likely for you to have a loss than if you've underpriced the business because you've just got less premium to cover cover the loss. So I think what's going on at the moment is we had a really interesting time. You go back 04, 05, right? Four events, four events. Katrina, biggest event in history. I think it it still might be the biggest U.S. uh, wind event in, in history happened. And incidentally, compared to Andrew, after Katrina, I believe the industry ran like a 100.1 combined ratio. So yeah. a complete change in scale, change in ability to manage the risk and what have you. Not a, not a giant you know, disaster after Katrina. So you had Katrina. You then had the longest period in recorded history without a Category 3 or greater making landfall in the U.S., so everyone got very happy with writing cat risk, right? And you can see it in the prices. The prices just went down and down and down and down until you get to 2016. And then you had Harvey uh, Maria, and you had, and then a bunch of like weird things, you know, freeze winter storm in Texas and what have you, and we just had Ian, and I mean, all, so it's been a sort of litany of, of unexpected, poorly modeled uh, catastrophe losses that have happened since 2017. And partly that's just sort of a regression towards the mean, but partly I think it's climate change effect, right? And these models, the, the commercial cat models tend to be pretty sticky. People don't like their PMLs to change. They don't like having major revisions in the models. And so they're, you know, they're very much backward looking and climate change is moving apace, right? I think we would hopefully all agree the climate is just different than when I was a kid, right? It is cold, it is not so cold in the winter and it is hotter in the summer and it, it just is, it's observable. And how are we projecting that forward is, is leading to sort of underpricing. So that's a, a, another angle, you know, the simplest part of your premiums get the expected loss right. We're talking about how you get that add on for, for risk, but you've got to get the EL part right. And and that I think is part of what's causing the problem on CAD at the moment, because we've got this trend that's very difficult to see how to in- incorporate into your into your modeling and your pricing. John, do you have a take on what the CEOs are disagreeing about in these earnings reports? No, I'll defer to Steve on that. <laughs> uh, I, one of the things that comes to mind as you're talking there, Steve, and this is back to what I wanted to at least finish covering on, or not finish, but at least tie a uh, piece to the liability discussion, is it, covering calculating a profit load is not the only thing actuaries do or the actuarial function in an insurance company does. It is the only thing that you're covering in your book. <laughs> but you know, there's lots of other important stuff, things like understanding what the expected loss should be and collecting the data and, you know, and underwriting for that matter of figuring out whether... Uh, the moral hazard of an insurance insured or and and a variety of really important functions that create inputs to the pricing process but those other inputs might be more important in other lines of business yes in personal order where you've got to do very granular pricing for example and we're quite upfront about this. I think page one line about two or three is you know we start after the heavy lifting has been done right we are definitely swooping in at the end so Totally agree with that. And and casualty being an important example where it's really the expected loss that's actually where all the work gets done. Do you agree with that? It depends what, I mean, GL is such an interesting line because it's so varied, you know, ranging from your million primary on a, some mom and pop, you know, retail operation through your right Nexus DNO on a Bermuda form for a fortune 500 corporation, uh, you know, 
the former's all about the last cast, the, the latter's probably more about the risk line. Yeah, well, I would say like a premium weighted average across liability lines. Like, you know, mostly it can be primary liability, general liability for small commercial, I would think, or auto liability, yeah, actually. Yeah, it's, it's more, it's very much more loss cost. Uh, you're you're going to get, you're, so I, I think here's the issue is, whatever the premium load is, it's not going to vary, right? What separates property is, I can know for absolute sure fact that your location is in Miami. And it needs yeah. a higher risk load than this location that's in Dayton, Ohio, or somewhere like that, right? It's very hard to do that for, for GL or commercial auto or what comp or something. So you tend to end up with risk loads that are sort of the same across the board, which then makes, you know, the type of work we're doing becomes less less important for those guys. Yeah, that's actually the thing that I wanted to kind of like, I don't know, I don't know challenge is the right word, because I think it is a little bit of a, uh, uh, you know, a, a changing around of what you're trying to do with the book. But... We do see volatility of results from the CEO and the earnings call perspective in casualty business, quite a lot of it, um, actually. And there are periods of time, maybe just as many in history for volatile casualty results as there are for volatile property results. And, you know, in the work that Steve, you and I have talked about, but I know, John, you were involved in this as well. You look back across history, it's the volatility of the casualty results that have actually really um, caused problems for the insurance industry as a whole, as opposed to property. So in some sense, the volatility of casualty is a more important problem. But the source of that volatility is not the same kind of source. And so I guess you have to treat it differently from a margin perspective. Like, you know, t talk to me a little bit about why the volatility of the casualty results does not require an approach or in what way maybe it does require an approach similar to what you're, you're describing in the book. John, you want to? I, I just say it comes down to the modeling. You know, it, it, you've got to get a handle on that joint distribution of losses you know without that you're you're at a loss you don't you can't you can't you know step one figure out your loss cost your your distribution of losses step two okay what does that imply for the margins uh, yeah gotta, i think gotta... that's exactly it and and you can know that and have greater sort of differentiation in output on property because it's location driven than you can on casualty Right, there is simply no analog of a cap model for work comp or something that's going to say. Uh, I mean, yeah, we all know roofers are a higher hat, but it's a higher loss cost, is, and you know, it, it's just not as as kind of certain, and so it can't drive differences as effectively as it does on the property side. Well, you know, some of my former colleagues were are working on catastrophe uh, casualty models, and you know, maybe someday they'll have some success with that. Uh, when they do, though, there'll be a comparable input, but uh, they're not there yet, to my uh, knowledge. Yeah, I, I'm still not happy. So <laughs> I, I, because when I look at in the marketplace, I see certain lines of business that are kind of perpetually poorly rated. <laughs> Let's say, I mean, how many actuarial kind of presentations you guys sat through, like I have at the CAS, that talks about trucking risk? It's like very hard to price for some reason, um, and some lines of business are. And there might be like, you know, social institutional fact, like here's an example, pizza delivery, right? So work on pizza delivery periodically. Um, mainly the risk in a pizza delivery uh, uh, operation is you have a kid, maybe somebody not a kid, but let's say driving their parents' car delivering pizzas. And that is a, what they call a hired and non-owned auto. Now, if you pull the hired and non-owned auto product off the shelf, what, that, what that's designed for is like a contractor that just uses their car once in a while to drive to and from a job site pretty modest exposure, but this is like a, this is more like a Amazon delivery truck, <laughs> right? As opposed to somebody driving their car around incidentally, you know, but the industry seems to like get like fundamentally confused about what is, what is going on here because the label of the policy does not describe what they usually expect to see. And so there's like, you know, you have to be very wary when you're writing hard and non-owned auto, uh, right? And, you know, to me, like there's a, you might sneak in something, right? So you want to try to like, you know, what I'm trying to get at here is that the actuary might want to insulate themselves from some unknowables or some poor, poorly known variables inside of the expected loss calculation through a higher margin. Um, so you, I don't have the tools to understand this. I know that the results or the pricing risk is higher here of getting it wrong. So can I not Use pull out the pricing insurance risk book and you know calculate a better margin uh, on on this because I, I want to protect myself. So that's volume two, 
Okay. John is now despondent because he didn't know there was going to be a volume two. But I, I, <laughs> it's I a think, small book. It's going to be yeah. easy. Six months. <laughs> so it, I, I was, you know, my goal going into writing this book was sort of baby steps. I wanted a sort of rational, coherent model that I could apply to the sort of big problems that we see that made sense, right? And it's a, it's a simplified model. It's a lot of things get abstracted away. What I've subsequently been working on, spent a lot of time thinking about, is the kind of things you're talking about here, which is, is really about qualitative risk, right? And, and so I've sort of coined the expression, I want a quantitative approach to qualitative risk, right? Which sounds like a, an oxymoron. But where you get to with the examples that you brought up is it tends to all be about the loss cost. It's, and yes, you could argue that it's, you know, there's more risk, so you maybe need a slightly larger risk load there. But, but really what you're, you're, you're saying is you're not able to estimate the loss cost or you're, you're not doing a good job on that. And that's the problem. It, it isn't it just, you know, in total for your line, there's going to be maybe 10 points of margin to play with. You're, you know, it doesn't give you the scope to come up with creative allocations that it does on, you know, you look at a cat reinsurer, they're going to run a 50-60 combined ratio, right? So you've got 40 points of margin that you're playing with. And then, you got, you know, expenses and what have you, as opposed to, you know, seven points. So I think all those things are important. You know, goodness of fit, fitting categories is obviously, is, is, a, is, a, is kind of what you're talking about with the, the trucking. And I love trucking as well. I think commercial auto is a great line of business. Um, and it is almost universally terribly done, right? You've got Progressive, I think, runs about 15, 20 points better than everyone else, and they're growing, <laughs> doing, doing an amazing job, and leaving everyone else in the dust. There's a couple of exceptions, but that's, that's broadly the case. But that's got nothing to do with risk loss. That's just because they can come up with the expected loss component more effectively, and they can do it cheaper, right? They've got this big expense advantage. People tend not to look at that, but they've got an expense advantage as well. So they're pricing more accurately, and they've got an expense advantage. They're the future uh, that clearly. It sounds like what you're talking about is not pricing risk, but pricing uncertainty. Okay. Could be. What is the difference between those things, John? Well, you know, one of the underlying assumptions or theories uh, behind the book is, you know, why, why do we have these risk loads anyway? Uh, and, and part of that gets back to, you know, the, the uncertainty Yep. what you're dealing with. Uh, and, and we argue in a few paragraphs here and there that uh, the reason that high you know, tail risk in CAT uh, bears such a, a large risk load is not because it's very risky, but because it's actually hard to get the loss cost, to hard, hard to get a good handle on uh, the, the distribution up in the tail there. So it's really the uncertainty that's driving the, the margin. And maybe in volume two, we can uh, expand on that and see <laughs> see how it might affect other lines of business. You know, that that's actually, you're touching on something I wouldn't mind if you, we could dwell on this for a second. So Steve, a second ago, mentioned they have 40 or 50 points of margin in these deals. And that's the case. And if you just sort of walked off the street um, and listened to us talk, you're saying 50% margins? <laughs> like, I mean, that's like Google. Uh, gets 50% margins, what what could possibly justify other than an, an impenetrable network effect, kind of, you know, thinking about other typical business um, uh, advantages, uh, a 50% margin? Whoa. Like, that's why huge. Why is it a 50% margin? Why is it 50% margin? Because you're writing a very levered bet. And to make, we went back to fairness at the beginning, right? You've got to have the financial resources to back your promises up. And if you promise to pay someone, say, 100 bucks if a bad thing happens, but there's only a 1% or 2% chance that it happens, your loss cost is, you know, so 1% or 2 cents. But you've got to have that 100 bucks sitting there, and you, you might lose it. And you need some return for that, and you might want a 15 20%, 15% return, say, on that. So you need 15 cents of, of total resources, so you'd be looking at, you know, say a three-point loss cost, 15% premium, 12, 12 points of margin. It's, it's, you know, four times your, your expected loss. It would be even bigger. But it's simply because the bet's so levered, the tail is so big, and you've got to finance that tail. That's expensive. And the tail is only there because of the cat. You take the cat away, the tail goes away. 
You can run a, a much more levered book of business. You know, in insurance terms, you can run it at a much higher premium to surplus ratio, and you can get a higher ROE with a much lower margin. So it's all about kind of squeezing the balloon, and, and cap means low leverage. Low leverage is expensive. Okay, so I, I want to push back a little bit against the, um, and you know, I'm going to be devil's advocate here, and I'm going to criticize the entire project behind this book. And so I'm going to say that another way of putting what you said, Steve, and maybe John, you can respond to this first, is, well, all the companies that don't charge a 50% margin go out of business because <laughs> they can't afford to pay for the thing that hits later on. Right, so there's like an emergent outcome here, which is the survivors charged a 50% margin, so that's what it's worth, and that's the you know, that's the market dynamic that allows the insurance companies to to continue offering policies because they are managed in a certain way. Now, the problem with that story is that that's not a scientific process. You know, they could just say like if you're like an old school Lloyd's underwriter, I know you guys know what I'm talking about. You're like, I just charge a 50% margin. Why? Because it works. Well, why do you know it works? You know, it just works. And he's right, <laughs> or she's right. Um, and that's all they need to know. You just charge a 50% margin in Florida. I don't need any of this pricing insurance. Look at the size of this textbook, all these Greek symbols, to hell with it. I'm just going to charge a 50% margin because I know what that works. And you know what? There's a guy charging a 40 and a 30 and a 20, and they go in and out of business over time. And eventually there's sort of this market outcome whereby we discover what the right level is based on the history that we experience. And so this is all just kind of justifying a result that we see that allows actuaries to tell themselves a nice story, but actually doesn't imp impact the market. John? You know, I confess I didn't really follow that logic. You, do you no? seem to be arguing that that is uh, the way the world works and that it's that it makes sense? I and mean, what doesn't make sense about that? Well, it doesn't make sense because I'm, I'm, I'm arguing against the, the intentionality. So I'm saying that there, we have no control. You might say I'm going to have a spectra, I'm going to do spectra risk measures and all that later on in this conversation, um, and I'm going to say I want this kind of margin, that kind of margin. But really, you're just reacting to the market prices. And okay, the well, fair enough, fair enough. Um, okay. You know, and, and again, it's really kind of an input to the process that we're talking about. You know, our book doesn't say, oh, you need a 15% margin or you need a 40% margin. Uh, it really kind of starts with that, you know, in most of the applications that we're talking about, the uh, the required return on your portfolio, on your business, is uh, an input to the process. It's handed down from your CFO or your CEO, and the actuary doesn't get to choose that number. It's given to him. And so then you know, the implications from there is that, okay, if this is the hurdle rate for my business, then how do I apportion it out? to the lines? How do I portion it out to the policies? And, and that's where you know, we spend most of our time talking about how to do that uh, fairly and, and co consistently, coherently. Uh, the, you know, the overall margin, you know, we, don't, we don't have a lot of advice as to where that's supposed to come from. Is that, is that Steve, fair, Steve? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I think you know, the, when you're talking about risk, it's a it's a qualitative thing. It's a subjective thing. There is no like objective right answer. What the market does is it puts a price on risk, and that's an input to us. And the reason that the margins are so and, and when we talk about these margins, let's be clear here. We're talking about a margin relative to premium, right? Not a margin relative to capital. That margin is essentially uh, derived by people are going out to the capital markets and they're raising capital, and that's a very open, competitive, transparent market, and that, you know, their cost of funding translates into these margins that we see uh, on premium. But yeah, as John said, we're not, we don't have a view around what that right number is, and it, you can see it, it ebbs and flows over time uh, with, with the market, and that's what we've seen in, in the Capron market, you know, uh, recently, um, it's got a lot more expensive. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's, a, it's an input. It's not a, it's not something that the, the theory derives. But as John said, what, what we're focused on is, all right, so we've got this number, there's, there's this total margin you need to allocate fairly between your insurance, and there's implications of you don't want subsidies and what have you. Uh, when you do that, that's really the sort of central work of the book is to come up with ways of doing that. So one of my, um, one of my favorite passages in the book uh, is well, you reference it at the beginning, maybe even these words at the beginning in the intro where you say you say you have a lot of really interesting kind of encapsulations of kind of why you wrote this book. And one of them is, OK, what's the what's like the um, 
what's the TLDR kind of version of this book? Which chapters should you hit? And you have this list. You're saying you should only read these. And you list out like, and it's probably a 15 bullet point list. But like this section of this chapter and this section of this chapter. Um, I love that. And I did that. <laughs> um, but uh, I also meandered a little bit more broadly. But there's one part you say, read, you know, if you have to calculate a risk margin, read this section and then read it again. <laughs> and then um, read it twice. And I read that section more than twice. And What's interesting about that section is that you start by talking about the regulations around actuaries, the, the statement of principles. God, what are ASOPs now? Uh, actual statement of principles, right? Sorry. Um, and, then, and then you say, and then look at market prices. Look at the bond market. And I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't know very many actuaries that spend much time looking at bond prices. Uh, but this is what you're getting at, right? You're saying, well, what are the market price for risk? And we have to go to... Uh, markets that trade in <laughs> in things li in a liquid fashion to get sort of get an accurate ballpark estimate for certain probabilities what they pay for, what they're pay, you know how much they pay in in some marketplace to be able to translate that back and there's going to be some judgment and other things you apply but bringing that back to insurance but I, I was consistently thrilled and this is one of the reasons why Steve you and I get along uh, is that you do uh, uh, and you know mentor to all of us Don Mango I uh, to talk a lot about kind of we're embedded in a world around insurance that uh, has a lot to help us <laughs> with um, and it's not just the math paper of some guy in Switzerland it's actually there there are lots of analogous processes in the economy that insurance actuaries can and should and must learn from yeah, yeah, I mean, so so on that, um, I'd say probably, certainly, you know, one of the more important ideas in the paper is um, when we think about a cost of capital, uh, is it constant or not, okay? And the evolution of that is quite interesting. So uh, you go back into the 80s and the 90s, and people were doing this uh, underwriting betas. They were trying to find systematic risk in underwriting, yo, because we wanted to use a capital asset pricing model type thing. So if a, if a line had a systematic component, you know, it, it did worse when the economy did worse, then that would be a more expensive line and blah, blah, blah. So we tried to do this and it just didn't work, right? It was terrible. Uh, in, in the sense that there wasn't enough sort of statistical information to come up with a clear signal. And the academic papers at the time said, uh, we all know that the cost of capital should vary with line, but frankly, trying to estimate what, what the variation is will introduce more error than it's worth. So we'll just go with a constant cost of capital. And that was sort of that. Admitting, was, admitting that it was, it, it was admitting wrong. Admitting it was wrong, right. Admitting it was wrong. Now, as soon as you've done that, a number of things become really easy. Because essentially, when you, you're talking about allocating margin, if your cost of capital is constant, allocating capital and allocating margin are the same thing because you just take your capital and you multiply it by constant, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a super easy thing and you get all of these, you know, nice sort of marginal capital uh, allocation methodologies come out. Now, what we somehow forgot there was, well, that's one dimension we could think about whether capital is constant or not, right, across line of business. But there's another dimension that we can think of, which is how far removed from loss is that dollar of capital? And if we had thought of that, we could have opened our Wall Street Journal on literally any day it was published, and we could have gone somewhere to the back, and we could have found a credit yield curve that would tell us what the rating was on AAA rated corporate bonds, double A, single A, triple B, blah, 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 and what do you know? We would see those yields are all different, right? That the further removed from loss you are, the cheaper your capital is, okay? And in, within an insurance company, you can think of that as right. So I've got this big slug of, of capital supporting my risks. The dollars at the top end are cheaper than the dollars at the bottom end, right? So in, in terms of the sort of required return. And if you could sell each dollar separately, the, you, you would get a, you know, a higher price, less discount at the top than you get at the bottom. Now, where that becomes super, super important is the consumption of the different layers varies across the lines of business. Okay, so as soon as you allow your different layers to have a different cost, which they incontrovertibly do, right? Every single market in the world, you see that. Cap bond market, corporate credit, you know, sovereign credit, everywhere, you see that. Because the lines consume different amounts of capital by layer, they're all going to come up with their own unique cost of capital. So it gives us a sort of backdoor way to figuring out what the cost of capital is by line. 
Okay. I, I think, you know, historically, what the big problem was is that once you started to, you know, once securitization got interesting, capital markets started getting interested in insurance, insurance started getting interested in capital markets, all of these researchers, academics and whatnot, people writing papers, they focused on capital allocation. And that was the big diversion, the big red herring, hmm. uh, chasing capital allocation and, and thinking that if we can get this problem solved, then all we have to do is multiply by the cost of capital, and voila, we're allocating our costs, our, 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 our margin. And, and just, you know, how many papers were written to allocate capital? I can't even count them. So, John, you said something uh, pretty interesting there, uh, that there's a massive detour, intellectual detour the industry took in trying to allocate capital. What do you mean by that? Okay, you know, I'm, I'm not sure the genesis of it. I think uh, allocating capital seemed to be a natural thing to do because uh, if, you're, if you're a finance person, all of your studies have been with industrial companies and allocating capital makes sense there because, uh, you know, a dollar to buy uh, a new equipment or a factory or something is a dollar that you cannot spend somewhere else. And so, you know, Capital is allocated. That's exactly how you do it. And then you have questions of the, the NPV of the project, et cetera, et cetera. And so th that mindset, I think, carried over to the insurance world where they said, okay, well, you've got all these different lines of business, and so let's, let's figure out what's the right way to allocate capital uh, among them. And, uh, and as our, our, our fearless leader, bless his soul, Don Mango, pointed out, you know, in the insurance industry, capital is a shared asset. It's not the same. Uh, and therefore, uh, it doesn't, you know, it's not immediately obvious that uh, allocating it is the right, the right thing to do. But nonetheless, that was the approach that was taken. And, and you know, of course, in academia, uh, in order to get published, the, the safest way to get published is to start with something that someone else published and improve upon it. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, once you get momentum in a certain direction, it just keeps going. Now, I, I'd like to tell you a little, a little personal story here, and I want to preface it by explaining a little background in my association with the National Bureau of Economic Research Insurance Project Group. Uh, the, when, you know, when Guy Carpenter started getting involved in securitization, we hired Professor Ken Fruit of Harvard Business School as a consultant to help us uh, work those things out. And one of the things I was looking at was the basis risk of index-linked contracts. Index, and uh, it turned out, you know, I turned that into a paper, presented at a conference uh, that actually turned out to be, I think that was the inaugural meeting of this group uh, and eventually uh, accumulated quite a few uh, of the, the demigods of the insurance economics profession. I mean, uh, yeah. You know, names like David Cummins, uh, Ken Fruit, of course. Uh, I've I got a bunch of names here, uh, if you're interested. And uh, they started meeting uh, every year uh, up in Cambridge, and I was privileged to, uh, to be able to attend those meetings, too. Um, even got to present a paper a couple of times. But the whole point of that was I was there when Stuart Myers presented the Myers-Reed Capital a Allocation paper to the NBER meeting there. And the, the reaction, my reaction, and, and I think other people's reaction, was pretty electrifying. It's like after years of people groping towards how to allocate capital, some methods looking pretty ad hoc, some of them not so ad hoc but not perfect, it looked like they found the answer. And, and to me, it was electrifying. Uh, they had, it was almost like a magic trick. It's like, this, uh, you know, take a few... Uh, reasonable assumptions and work it through, and in the end, you have something that actually is an allocation. It adds up. It you know wasn't obvious at the beginning that it was going to add up, but by golly, it does. And you know, I, I ran to the phone to call my boss Gary Venter and tell him it was solved. You know, the, the capital allocation problem was solved. You know, back then, you know, I, I I was still drinking the Kool Aid too. And of course, you know, it wasn't the last word. And uh, I'll let Steve. 
Well, could you, could you tell me if you remember, to... just before we move on, I mean, maybe this is where you're going to go, but what was the insight? What was the thing that cracked it? Well, I mean, and in, in, in fully understanding this is like a, a tangent for the business, uh, but what I was the I'd thing like that they did? I think I'd like to defer to Steve there. Okay. I think he, he's got a, a better handle on the ins and outs of this than I do. So the, the tangent is the, uh, the right, uh, the, the critical word there in what you said. Um, the myers reed allocation formula relies on the fact that if you've got a straight line, you can get to anywhere along the straight line. You know, the, the tangent point at anywhere along the straight line is the same, right? The tangent right. point always points along the line. There's no curving going on. And that's why myers reed works, right? Because it's basically saying I can extrapolate as far as I want along a line because it's straight. And the problem is insurance losses are not straight in that way because – the, my, what Myers-Reed relied upon was that the shape of the distribution of losses doesn't change with volume. Well, it manifestly does change with volume, right? Because if I've got hmm. one vehicle that I insure, I have a 90% chance of no losses and then some losses. If I've got a million vehicles I insure, I've got essentially no chance of no losses, and it's a completely different shape. So that assumption just doesn't hold in practice. Um, and that assumption that your, your distribution, the shape of your distribution is invariant uh, to volume is the, the key thing that Myers-Reed relies on, right? Now, why did they make that assumption, you might ask? Well, because, again, going back to what John said, that is the correct assumption to make when you're dealing with assets. When you're dealing with a portfolio of stocks, each stock has got a return distribution, and the distribution I get from owning one stock, a thousand stocks, or a million stocks of, of one company, it scales exactly. It never changes shape, right? It just You just multiply it by the right. number of stocks you've got. So okay. that is the exact right assumption to make in the investment world. And as usual, the investment guys thought, oh, well, let's just apply it to insurance. That seemed, and, you know, we got a long way with doing that, right? So let's not, you know, all due respect, right? A lot of good insights came out of that. But that is not how insurance works. So it doesn't apply um, to insurance. So it actually wasn't a, a, a magic solution. Although the idea of a marginal approach, you know, is essentially what we, we ended up with and is okay, again, provided you're uh, differentiating, you're, you're taking margins of a, of a differentiable smooth function. And that is the sort of little detail that often comes to bite you in the butt. So, so you can see the mechanism right here, okay? You can see how, yeah. how somebody like Steve can look at what they did and put his finger on the problem. And if he cared to at that time, uh, he could write another paper that goes into that and explains how that needs to be adjusted to, to do a better job of capital allocation. Uh, but everybody's drinking the Kool-Aid. Everybody is assuming that allocating capital is what we ought to be trying to do. And that's the big mistake. So hey, don't I think what he did... Sorry, no, I did. Sorry. I wrote two two papers about yeah. that. You know, got a I, grand total of about six citations, but you know, you try. <laughs> yeah, I read them, Steve. Um, uh, and you know, I can't say like I put enough effort in to fully grasp them. But I, I do want to come back just for a second to kind of this the, the concept of well, just a little bit of this story. So what appears to me that they did was they took a result which was well established in capital allocation for equities, and they just copied and pasted it. I mean, not a little better than that. Because you imagine if you're Myers or Reed and you're just wandering and, oh, this is a problem in insurance. Well, we just figured this out. So, guys, just do this. No, it's a little more sophisticated than that. Yeah, it was okay. Yeah. There was, it's interesting when you read the papers that it, it's, it's always easier to explain something once you understand it as opposed to develop <laughs> it in the first place, right? It's like, you know, sure. the people who invent something take forever to do it, and then the people who copy it do it really quickly because they've you know, all the all the problems have been sorted out, right? So, do and there was we've got a whole chapter basically on the sort of the struggle to get to a consistent theory, and it's a really interesting story. So, you know, it, it was a good paper. It was a really important um, stepping stone. And it, well, it, if I recall correctly, if I recall correctly, it was really about equalizing the the insolvency put, wasn't it? Yeah, EPD. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you know, it's not just a simple uh, you know e extrapolation, you know, like Cap M or something. It, it had a little more nuance to it than that. Yeah. Okay. 
Let's carry on to, if we could. I just I'm chomping at the bit to say a few things about this allocating margin versus allocating capital. Right? Please do. Um, so, as, as John said, for manufacturing, capital gets spent. So it's you've got a pool of money, or you can raise money, but you spend it. It goes somewhere. It's, it's in plant and equipment, and it's obviously it's a pooled resource for insurance. It's different, as Don pointed out. Also, I would note as one of the really other important papers here was the Phillips Cumming and Allen paper um, that came out around the same time, 96, 97, uh, where they used option pricing theory to do an, an allocation. And they explicitly say, capital is a shared asset. It does not make sense to allocate it, right? We're trying to get to prices. But is, if you compare thinking about allocating capital to allocating margin, and the way you've got this margin that you want to allocate is you've got a certain total amount of capital, and you can look at your peers and things and you can look at valuations and you can say, well, I, what number do I need to publish to Wall Street to you know, have a decent valuation? Okay, that's the amount of margin I need to make, right? And you've got to then think about allocating that out a, a, across your risk sources. Compare that to allocating capital, right? So you publish detailed financials that give you the components of the margin. They are real, tangible things. Business unit leaders are held accountable for that income that they produce. Margin, right? This is what it is. It's a real thing. You're, you have stock analysts who are estimating how much margin you're going to make, right? There's a lot of people publishing real, and you can, at the end of the day, you can point to the dollars. There they are. There's, the, there's my margin. It's a real thing. The capital allocation, completely, completely notional, right? No one has an opinion on it. It's not published anywhere. There's, there's no sort of external views written. It's not a tangible thing in the way margin is. So just simply from the fact of, of, of you know, corporeal versus ethereal, there's a big advantage that, to allocating uh, margin. It also matches up really nicely with risk, right? You think about what does your income statement look like? Well, you've got underwriting income that goes with underwriting risk, and you've got investment income that sort of goes with reserving assets and reserving risk and capital and, and asset risk, right? So you can sort of match things up a bit better. You never have this problem which comes up often when you allocate capital. Oh, we've got excess capital. What do we, how do we allocate the excess capital? Well, don't care, because we're talking about the margin. If you've got excess capital, maybe you need a lower return. It's reflected in the margin number. I'm just gonna allocate the margin. So there isn't this problem, this kind of quote unquote, excess um, capital problem. And then, but for me, the real, the real, <laughs> Um, you know, nail in the coffin on not allocating capital was I remember when I read Neil Bodoff's paper, which is another great innovation, um, you know, in thinking and, and was really close actually to kind of what we came up with in the book with, with spectral risk measures. I went through that, I did his, his allocation, and I went, oh, yeah, okay, I see how this works. This is great, very clever. Um, what's the premium? Oh, I don't know what the premium is because I need a cost of capital on which he has nothing to say. So, you, you do all this work to allocate your capital, and actually the thing you want, which is what premium am I going to quote on this risk, you don't know because you're missing a giant ingredient. If you allocate the margin, you can determine the premium right there because it's like, all right, I need $27 a margin. I add it on with the lost cost and expenses. I'm good to go. So if I, if, let, me, um, let me try my understanding here. Okay, so... Capital allocation does make intuitive sense because in the case of bringing physical capital, you can imagine dollars getting applied to a business unit and then they have to then generate a return over those dollars and you can measure the dollars, you can measure the return and it's all tangible. I get that. You also have a tangible amount of dollars in an insurance company. Now it sits in a pot, it doesn't get handed to somebody, right? Um, but I can imagine saying, you know, how much of that do I need to give you to show me what your return on capital is going to be. You know, I had a, I interviewed somebody once. I can't remember which one it is. Um, and I, you know, this wasn't even on my podcast, actually. This was like at a panel discussion I was leading somewhere. Uh, and I asked a, a CFO of one of the reinsurance company, like, what's the right metric for determining performance? And, and uh, you know, is it combined ratio or what is it? And he said, uh, actually, it's a properly specified return on capital. That's what I want to know. I want to know whether this unit is giving me enough profit to fund the risk. And that requires a denominator and a numerator. The numerator is the amount of money you're spending, and the denominator is the amount of capital you have. So the intuition there 
makes sense to me. So Steve shook his head. Where is that wrong, Steve? And why does allocating margin give you a better um, All right. So the way the answer. way I believe that the CEO should talk about it with a business unit head is I'm sitting here and I have $10 billion of capital, which and you as a business unit person are going to expose that $10 billion to risk. And you could expose a dollar of it, none of it. You could expose all of it, right? And okay. I've got three or four other business units, and they could also expose all of it, right? So, they, you know, I can't say, oh, you only get a quarter of it, because if you come to me and you actually have a loss, which is half of it, I am legally obligated to pay it. So what the – see, I believe the better way to think about it is not, oh, I'm going to give you a quarter of it, and so the charge is, is a quarter of whatever. It might it's simply – there's an entrance fee to expose – all of my capital to risk. And for you, it is this many dollars. I, I don't need to go through this extra step of allocating capital. I don't, it, it doesn't add anything. It, okay. it, it's, it, it, it's a historical, and it, it goes back, as, as John said, to um, thinking about manufacturing products and IRR and NPV and all that type of thing. But you don't have to do that. You, you can just do it directly and you can come up with a view of, all right, for you, it's 250 you know, million or whatever. And for this guy over here, it's 350. And for this other guy, which has virtually no risk, it's only 50 million. Right? I'll give you access to all 10 billion for a much lower number, whatever it is. But you can do it directly as a sort of gate charge to access all of your capital. Okay. And that well, gate the, charge. L l l let me say it a slightly different way. The, the CEO says, I'm sitting on a, a, a billion dollars of capital and exposing it to uh, all of my lines of business. And I have determined that in total, I need $100 million of margin to, to okay. cover this risk. That's, that's what my investors need to see. And so I need to take that $100 million and gather it from all of you guys. And given the risk that your line of business presents to this pot of money, your share is $25 million. Yeah, exactly. Brilliant. So how long did it take us to get there? So we have my, let's get back, let's get back to Myers Reed. That's Myers Reed, right? Um, now we sort of get a feel for the end point. What, tell me more about the journey. I want to hear about the history. I think the history is really interesting. So I think all we go through like what I would sort of regard as the, the seminal papers here, right? And it, okay. it was Myers Reed. It was a Sean Wang paper. Um, there was the Phillips Cumming and Allen that we discussed. There was a paper by uh, Sheris, and then there was a Bragamoff, uh, Jaffe, and Walden. That was, I think, 2010. Um, I believe they all have a constant cost of capital. Right? Really? It's a common thing. They are all tucked into this capital allocation framework. I'll let John talk about, you know, Don coming up with it. It's a, it's a shared asset. And I think, uh, didn't Gary Venter also talked about allocating margin? But for me, the penny dropped when I realized that the cost of capital varied by line. Now you can't interpret an ROE anymore because if, you're constant, if you've got a constant cost of capital, it's 10%, and you return me 12 on your capital, that's good, right? That's objectively good. And if you return me 8, that's objectively bad. But if my cost of capital varies by line because my capital cost varies by layer, different business units consume different amounts of capital by layer, so you get a, a varying target, now I don't know if 12 is good. 12 is bad if you should be returning 20, and it's great if you should be returning 10. I, I don't know. So it's kind of a useless metric. So, John, maybe you can um, – maybe be good. it would be interesting to talk a bit about some of the folks that Steve just mentioned in passing because you got to work with some pretty awesome thinkers uh, within the insurance industry at Guy Carp uh, over the last kind of 25 years or so. Yeah, well, that, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that. But let me, let me start 35 years ago. When uh, an Israeli economist named Menachem Yari looked at utility theory and said, well, "You know, there's another way you can do that. You know, utility theory, as we know, takes uh, takes a, a distribution, and in our case, distribution of losses, and says, okay, well, we're going to transform money into utility, util. So we're going to have a function that takes the dollars and turns that into what that dollar is really worth to you." Uh, and then instead of taking the expected loss, uh, P times X, we're going to take P times utility, U, and we'll call that your expected utility. And so you have this whole 
utility theory uh, built up around that principle. And Yari said, well, you know, what if you kept, left the dollars alone and altered the probabilities instead? So it's kind of a dual to utility theory, and, and that's what he called it. He called it dual utility theory. And he built up uh, a whole framework of that that was uh, you know, more or less uh, equivalent in terms of power and what it could do. Uh, and, and so if you, if you look at that, what is that? The, the expected value of a distorted probability times the actual loss, that's what spectral risk measures do. They take this distorted probability and use that instead of the original probability. So it, he, he did this 35 years ago. And there it sat out in the academic literature. And uh, so then there, were, there was Sean Wang and Gary Venter. I, uh, I was fortunate enough to work for Gary Venter for a while and to meet Sean Wang as, as part of that. And I forget which one came first, but Gary wrote a paper uh, that said, uh, well, you know, if you wanted to price reinsurance so that it was internally consistent and arbitrage-free, what you really need to do is you need to do something that you can get it down to, like, the individual dollars. What is the cost of a Bernoulli layer, a, you know, a, a layer that pays off all or nothing, uh, and you, you price that, and therefore you can then price anything else by adding up these a suitable weighted average of these layers. And, and only if you do that can you be sure that you're arbitrage-free, you know, it's... It's sort of arbitrage free, but you know arbitrage free within the context of your own pricing structure. And Sean Wang uh, you know, formalized that and uh, uh, you know came up with the application of distortion functions to pricing insurance risks. And so you know between the two of them, this was uh, this was really what kickstarted the understanding in the actuarial literature that uh, that this was something you could actually do. You know, at, at that time, everybody's casting around for risk measures. What's the right what way to measure risk? You know, risk being distribution of losses, a big complicated beast. How can we boil it down to one number? You know, what's the right way to do that? And they're just a, a, a virtual zoo of different ways of approaching that, different functions, different families of functions. And this was one family of functions on how to do that. Uh, and and that, you know, if you can follow that thread through, that's that's what we ended up with uh, in the book, uh, pulling that thread out amidst you know um, all of the noise uh, of things that did it other ways. <laughs> so uh, I I do want to like I do want to kind of ground this in a bit of your sort of like lived experience of being going through that moment um, because I think you had a great it was a, I mean it's a fascinating thing that a reinsurance broker, first of all, that doesn't take any risk, uh, employs a bunch of research academics who are actuaries, which is, you know, you mentioned, John, that you never really practice too much as an actuary. You're mostly a, a researcher, um, but you were an actuary and, and are. Um, and uh, and same with Gary and Don came a little, a little bit later. Um, Rodney Kreps, right? So there's a bunch of these people who are employed at Carpenter, um, again, not a risk-taking institution, but doing really fundamental research and influencing the direction of the industry from this place. Um, it, I, I'd love for, if you could just reflect on what that was like early on and sort of did you ever kind of have a sense that you guys were really doing real good groundbreaking kind of work? Well, yeah, I'd, li I'd like to believe so. I, I'd like to believe I wasn't just spinning my wheels. Uh, you know, back in the two, you know, again, when the securitization started and cat bonds became very uh, important and and popular, uh, you know, pricing cat bonds became a big issue. How do you do that? And, you know, all right, so we're brokers. We don't take any risk. But we got plenty of clients who do and who are coming to us, uh, us asking these kinds of questions. So it behooved us to, to try and come up with some answers. Uh, I remember uh, Rodney and I did a, a tour of reinsurers, we went down to Bermuda, talked to a bunch of people there, uh, upstate New York. We went, we went around, and we sat with their actuaries and we asked them, "Can you know what can you tell us about how you price cat risk? You know, what are you what are you willing to tell us?" And they were surprisingly forthcoming uh, with explaining, uh, you know, what they did, what they knew how to do, what they didn't know how to do. Uh, and so we we put that in a paper along with a, a regression analysis I did of some uh, some. Uh, layer data, reinsurance layer data that we had accumulated. Um, 
and uh, that became a chapter in Morton Lean's book, uh, Alternative Risk Transfer. And I think uh, that uh, was probably the second paper to appear uh, explaining how to price cat bonds. Uh, the first one, Morton Lane, he did himself a few years earlier than that. And then there's a whole, a whole uh, slew of those that have come afterwards, and they're, they're still doing it. They're still coming out with uh, – I just, I just saw one uh, today on uh, ResearchGate, another, yet another paper on how to price cat bonds. Um, so we thought, you know, we were, we were groping towards answers there, and, and uh, this was so something worth doing. Uh, and you know, my, at one point, my goal was to come up with a, a, a credible way of uh, assessing and estimating the market value of risk to an insurer. Uh, because we needed something like that in order to tell you what reinsurance is worth. Uh, You're trading how, how it. Did, if, <laughs> what's reinsurance? Should I buy reinsurance? How much yeah. should I buy? What kind should I buy? And it's like, okay. So the standard answer back then was, well, you got your cost uh, and you got your risk. And so we'll do a two-dimensional plot and put a scatter point of uh, all of your options here and identify the efficient frontier. Uh, and so, you know, whittle down your infinite number of possibilities to a finite number of possibilities and then the client would say okay well where do i want to be on the frontier and we're like well <laughs> where do you want to be i don't know uh, let, let's let's sit Where's down you with you and, and get your risk appetite uh, figured Love out it. uh so I, I wanted to collapse that down to to one dimension value uh and uh, my first attempts at that were highly sophisticated and highly ineffective for a couple of reasons uh, one, uh, too sophisticated, hard to explain. Uh, Don Mango got me to simplify that down, and uh, then it was easier to explain, but then it found it on the second reason, and that was because uh, cost of capital was an input and it was assumed constant. So it was only then when Don said, well, think about this capital tranching idea of mine. When we started to turn towards this, we, we had a, a group that would meet in Norwalk, Connecticut. We called it Project Norwalk. It came from multiple cities and even not even all the same company. Kent Ellingson was doing similar research on his own, and Don invited him in. And we hashed through what might, you know, what does capital charging really mean? And eventually came to the conclusion that it means spectral risk measures. It means distortion functions. It means what Sean Wang was talking about years ago. Uh, and then... And then the, the pieces fell into place. It's like, okay, this is the missing piece from my valuation models. Uh, and it, it appears in one of the later chapters of the book. So tranching capital, and I've heard Don explain this a bunch of times, um, we're talking about just having different costs at different levels of loss, right? Exactly. So a worse outcome is worse <laughs> uh, for me, basically, right? Uh, you know, a, a, a dollar that's at risk for a 1% uh, probability of being lost uh, commands a different premium from a dollar that's at a 10% probability of being lost. Yes. So now, Steve, I would like you to reconcile that with your earlier point about capital being cheaper the farther away it is from a loss. Tell me if I'm understanding and how do we put this together? <laughs> yeah. So it, this is the thing that is, is always blows people's minds a bit because – the further removed you get from loss, the cheaper the capital is as a percent of capital, but the more expensive the insurance is as a markup to expected loss. All right. Okay. So if you're, let's compare where you're at the, say, 50% chance of having a loss greater than that point and the 1% chance. So at the 50% the chance, you've got a 50% loss cost and you've got to fund the other 50% somewhere between premium and uh, capital, right? And let's go with like a 10% cost of uh, capital to keep it easy in that layer. So you've got, you've got to make five points of margin and you're going to get 45 points of capital. So your premium will be 55 cents. So your loss ratio will be about 90%, right? So you're, you're almost there. But you'll still get your 10% return. Now move up to the top, the 1% the level. Now you've got to fund 99 cents of capital. And you, know, you could do that with a constant, but let's say you're going to do that with a cap bond, and maybe it's, you can get away with doing that at a 3% return. Let's imagine we're back in the days when interest rates were zero, because I still haven't adjusted to that you know, little shift. right? So you're going to have to have three points of margin, 
and you're going to get 96 points of capital, and you're going to get one point of loss cost. But So you're going to 3% ROE, but what's your premium is going to be $0.04, cents and your loss cost is going to be $0.01. Cent. So your loss ratio is going to be $0.25, cents, or put the other way around, your markup will be 4x, four times mm-hmm. markup on expected loss to get to the premium. So the higher up you go, typically you get cheaper capital, but more expensive insurance because your leverage goes down, because your, your premium to surplus ratio goes down. Right. So you need so much more capital to you support so much a dollar of premium. Yeah. Right. So you got opposing movements. So it's cheaper, but you need so much more of it that, you know, it's expensive in, in another way. Um, how long did it kind of take? I, I'm interested in just sort of the evolution of, you know, Don's idea there about tranching capital. You know, where are, where are we now in, in time of the, the world history? So Krebs, uh, sorry, not Krebs, sorry, um, Myers, Reed, comes out with 96, 95, something like that. Right. Yeah, and, and the preprint was even earlier than that. It's probably John probably saw in the very early nineties. Okay, and so Don's idea of tranching capital, where we start we start thinking really hard about how there's not a constant cost of capital. Um, when is that kind of happening? How many? How long did it take for these to sort of emerge? Well, Ten years ago? Or oh no, no, it was late. It was uh, before two thousand, wasn't it? Fruit and O'Connell really was the first, uh, or um, that paper that you had the, the graph of that we use. Isn't that a O'Connell paper? I thought that was early 2000s. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there, well, you know, there, there's hints of that all the way back to uh, Yari. Uh, so, you know, it's, you know, what exactly are you trying to pin down here? Uh, I'm trying to, like, one of the things I'm interested in is how it evolved, the intellectual evolution of these ideas, right? Because they come, they come in a certain order, and I think that it's nice to – approach them in that order while we're trying to, well, I'm trying to learn about them here and we're trying to explain them to the audience. And so like, you know, the kind of the temporal evolution of this, these concepts, I just want to kind of trace that if we can. Yeah. Right. Okay. So it's I kind of like what you, what you're really asking for is, is the diffusion of these ideas yeah. uh, into a yeah. broader uh, audience. Yeah. So I think that the, the chronology, I would suggest goes something like this prior to Andrew, Everybody was looking for this systematic risk, you know, not diversifiable risk is not compensated. Um, we want our systematic underwriting betas and we're going to use a cap M type model and that's going to give us the cost of capital by line. And in the back of people's mind was the fact that, well, that might be a little problematic for catastrophe risk because that's clearly beta zero. So that would say that should be done at a risk free rate, but let's, let's park that, right? Then Andrew comes along, bam. Massive increase in the cost of cap risk, and you just can't ignore the fact that this clearly is not being written at a risk-free rate of return, right? It's some giant rate of return. And so academics caught on to this, and they're like, hmm, that's a puzzle that needs explaining. And, and so that was the beginning of this process to say, all right, we need some alternative theories. And, I, I, I you know, it was late late 90s, early, early 2000s. I mean, you've also got, like, the through Schaffstein and Stein papers, right? There's reasons why um, insurers are what are called opaque intermediaries, right? They intermediate between the risk owners and the capital markets, and they're very hard for people to understand. It's very hard to see what's going on in the insurance company, and that means they have a high cost of capital because you basically have to operate by trust, right? Mm -hmm. This is actually one of the other big innovations of cap bonds, uh, uh, cap models, is they give you an independent third-party view of the risk. You can't get that on liability. You you literally have to trust the trust the old Lloyd's underwriter to oh I think the rate is you know less than such, and and because you introduce that element of trust, that drives a, a capital cost component, and the fact that insurers have costly capital means they have a real interest in preserving it. They don't want to get themselves in a situation where they have to go and ask for more because the very act of asking for more will make underwriters think, oh, there's something wrong here. I'm going to charge you a lot for it, and you're going to get diluted, right? So they're all about have they've got this sort of vested interest in risk management, and that's why it becomes effective for them to sort of buy risk uh, reinsurance and, and transfer losses and things. So I think it, it all went back to the big increase in um, cap prices that happened after Andrew that needed explaining. It didn't fit into the existing theories. We had to come up with some alternative theories, SRMs was a great explanation. So I uh, love that re- you know, your implicit reference to a podcast I did with um, Samir Shah on on innovating the capital stack. Where it, the thing that I really took away from that conversation was just what you said there, Steve, which is the the key to unlock a lower cost of capital is to give 
direct clarity right to the risk. So now yes. you don't have to trust people anymore, which you're going to have yeah. to charge for that trust with a higher cost of capital. But if I know what's going on, then I can do it cheaper because I can I know how to diversify that against what. And yeah. um, That's great. A uh, real profound point. Uh, I want to come back to this Fruit and O'Connell thing because you mentioned something in the book, and maybe you've already explained it to me, in which case you can tell me this, but they, they did a study, it was really neat, of uh, Guy Carpenter cat clients or deals for a couple decades, I think, and they found a puzzle in there. And do you guys... You guys have to sort of at command here what that puzzle was that they were kind of like trying to figure out uh, uh, and and solve. If I recall, the the notion was that uh, uh, uncertainty drives margin, but the but that doesn't make sense from traditional financial theory that uncertainty and risk should be treated symmetrically. Uh, if you have an upside and you have a downside, uh, then it's it's the expectation that matters. Uh, I think that was the puzzle. Uh, do you recall? Yeah, it's, it's char charging for diversifiable risk was the problem. That was a real mm. puzzle to, to, to the. Uh, so you have po positive margin on on different regions, uh, right? So Florida hurricane versus California earthquake, and I'm charging lots of margin on these, where I should just be charging a minimal thing because that risk can go away when you get the gun. Yeah, in investment speak, you have a zero beta stock with a big return. That's a problem for CAPM. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's, and, that's a problem. Right. Um, and so what was the resolution to that problem? Throw CAPM out. <laughs> there, there, there are all these reasons that go back to informational issues about why capital is costly for insurers that do not apply in other situations, right? If I'm a manufacturing corporation, I'm going to set up I'm going to raise capital to build a factory to manufacture widgets. I can compute the beta for that, you know, the cash flows that are going to come out of that particular factory, and it's all, I've spent the money, it's, you know, it's all very concrete and real, and it's, it's not at all for insurance. I'm going to sit here with a giant pot of money, which I'm going, to have a, I'm going to have invested in something, which I'm probably not going to disclose to you very clearly, which is going to be a problem. Um, and you're, you, you know, you're going to have to... Um, Try and understand the risks I'm, I'm putting against that, which I'm not going to establish clearly. Oh, by the way, we haven't mentioned reserving risk, which is a giant issue that comes along for, for casualty lines. I'm going to tell you my estimate of the losses, but I won't actually know for 25 years. You know, there's a whole bunch of things like this that make it. And I've got these regulator friends who can take over the company before it becomes insolvent and, and take your money away, and they won't let me dividend the money back to you. Well, for all of these reasons, insurance companies are a horrible investment, right? And so they, they command a higher cost of capital, and it's, it's that sort of frictional spread that, that then needs to be allocated out. That's kind of a big part of what we're, we're talking about here. A lot, and a lot of that is not pure risk or pure risk in the sort of process risk sense. That's just additional risk that sits commonly across all casualty lines. When you get, and then in addition to that, you get this pure risk element for uh, cat risk, which is, 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 is just the fact that you've got to finance a, a giant pile of, of, you know, liquid assets that you could lose at any, any moment in time. So you know, the there's another concept that um, I actually just checked my notes here that I, I, I forgot to mention earlier, but I think it might be helpful is, is quite a lot of insurances you know, interested in the idea of what the um, uh, required return or rather like what the imposed return might be in a regulated environment. So you have the regulator, which we haven't talked about too much here. And there was a paper a long time ago uh, that was written that was about Massachusetts Auto, and that was Myers Cohn. Is that oh, right? Cohen. Yeah. Cohen. Myers Cohn. Okay. And so in that paper is a really interesting quote about how, I think it's in that paper, but what uh, the required uh, return should be for an insurance company. Not required return, but... Um, what the what profit an insurance company should be, and so a regulator is trying to say we're going to force everybody to buy auto insurance. As a result, we're going to try and prevent insurance companies from uh, exploiting this privilege we're giving them to we're creating this giant business for them. So we're going to not allow them to, to charge too much money for it. We want to regulate the profit. So what much profit should we allow them to make? And uh, most of the conversation we're talking about here is in catastrophe lines, a little different from from um, uh, from or personal automobile, oh. but I think the concept still sort of wind up getting invoked in catastrophe business where it's a regulated market. So how much profit should an insurance company make? Well, I can't resist. You, you've brought up Massachusetts Auto here, so I have to just go back and 
that, that that was my uh, you know intellectual uh, coming of age, I guess, in the insurance industry was uh, when John was working with these great minds at, at Carpenter. I was working on Massachusetts Auto, and I met Richard Derrick there, who was the head of the Automobile in Insurance Bureau. His name is on a lot of these papers. Uh, they had some conferences. There was a conference there where I, I saw Rich Phillips present his PCA paper, which, you know, which was a sort of competitor to Myers, uh, to, to the Myers, um, Brit, Myers and Reed paper. Um, the, and, and interestingly, so in Massachusetts Auto, they would do a rate filing, which was about, I don't know, 500 pages long. And then they would do the underwriting profit provision filing, which I recall was longer. It was like 800 pages long. And here's the amusing thing about this. That underwriting profit provision, that those 800 pages justified, was negative <laughs> because of the investment income offset, right? So it was to, to justify running at 105 combined, we needed 800 pages of, of quite uh, abstruse math. Now, when you when you go through the the Myers Cone paper, um, it it doesn't actually deliver what you would hope because it just says, let's take a cost of capital. Well, your premium can only allow you to earn that cost of capital, but it doesn't give you the cost of capital. <laughs> okay. And, they, they, they would say, well, you know, well, often, and the mass guys would do the beta studies and try and come up with a, you know, a systematic risk of underwriting. And it is plausible, right, the commercial or the personal auto, because it's, um, it, the amount people drive is going to be correlated with the economy and you've got the inflation effect, right? It is possible that that could be a non-zero beta um, line of business. Um, but, but fundamentally what that paper is saying is, uh, that you need to price to hit a certain return on capital for it to be fair, but it doesn't tell you what the return is. Hmm. And so the return on capital is going to be given by somebody else. And, and it's going to it, come out of the market, right? Yeah, and and this, right. Was the, this was the totally weird thing about Massachusetts Auto was every year they would have this exercise where they would go through and they would find that there was insufficient competition in the marketplace. And, okay. and as a result of that, the commissioner set the rates and the commissioner set the rates that every company wrote at the same rates and the same form, right? And you couldn't underwrite. If someone came to you for insurance, you had to write them, okay? Your escape valve was you could seed them into a pool and then you would uh, assume back some proportion of, of the pool. And they also had things like uh, there were deliberate subsidies built into the rates. There was another wonderful filing that the AIB did called the subsidies in the rates that explicitly quantified what the subsidies were in the rates, so you knew. And if you had a 18-year-old male in central Boston, I think the subsidy in the rate was like, you know, he was charged 1000 or 2000 bucks, and he should have been charged 6000 bucks. right? It was a huge subsidy. And it was all subsidized by older drivers and non-urban drivers. And it was all clear. So the pool consisted of all the 18-year-olds, obviously, and in Boston, and it was sexless rating. They were way ahead of their time. You could the males and the females had to have the same rate, so you know there was there were subsidies there as well. And it was an absolutely. Fa I mean, I spent the first I think three years of my career working on it. Was absolutely fascinating because it was this sort of giant iterative dynamical system. You had to guess um, the the game that you played was what's my allocation back from the pool gonna be, right? And you could get credits if you kept bad risks, but that weren't too ter terrible, you would get a credit against your assessment. So you had to figure out how much the credit was worth. Well, the amount the credit was worth would depend on how much business got seeded into the pool, because if no business got seeded in, it wouldn't make a loss, credit wouldn't be worth anything. But if a ton of business gets seeded, it makes a huge loss and the credit's worth a lot. So the value that you have to assign to the credit depended on how much you thought other people would seed into the pool. Well, the amount they're going to seed in is what they think. The so you get this giant iterative system, right, where you start off with an assumption for the value of a credit. And you say, well, if everybody thinks this, they're going to seed this, and that's going to produce this other value for the credit. And then you keep going around until you get to a, until you get to a point. And it, 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 was fat. it was intellectually super – I mean, it was completely contrived, right? It was yeah. really just a function of regulation because everywhere else in the world – yeah, we all recognize we've got literally hundreds of insurance companies quoting on every piece of business. It's a really competitive market, but here it didn't work like that. But it was 
for as me as a young actuary fresh out of college, it was fascinating. I loved working on Massachusetts Order. It was great. I spent a lot of time, you know, talking with Richard Derrick about these things, um, you know, understanding all the work he was doing. He was a really friendly guy. And yeah, it was it was a, it was a dream for a for young actuary. So what do you learn? What, what's the lesson we can all take from that experience of yours? I, I mean, one, there's like government control can yield some stupid things. So that one we can learn all over the place in this world. But from a from a um, from an actuarial perspective, from a pricing, from a profit capital, I mean, what, what is the and the theme of the conversation today that you take from that experience that might matter for other parts of the business? Well, I, I would say somebody I, I heard once describe, they said, economics, you can summarize as people respond to incentives and all the rest is just detail. And okay. I, I think that's, you know, what I always try and do when, we, when I'm thinking about an insurance problem is what are the incentives here? What are the motivations? What is the underlying economics? And then how is that going to drive how people act? And if you follow that, and you follow that first, that will generally get you kind of to the right place. Okay. Uh, I would like to talk about an institution that um, whose incentives are, are interesting to me, and that's the insurance regulators. Now, one theme I don't think we've talked about yet in those conversations is this kind of cleavage between kind of a, a, a capital level that a company should hold, which is for the most part prescribed externally. You have – the investor and insurance regular saying this is how much equity you should hold. And you have a pricing process whereby you say what's the required return uh, now to fund this capital that you have to raise. And I'd like to talk about the regulator a little bit uh, about what their incentives are. Maybe you can start with that kind of framing on it, Steve, or you can pick a different one or John. Um, and how they how do they think about this problem, about how much capital insurance companies should hold? Do you think? So they promulgate minimum capital requirements through RBC. And most companies run RBC ratio, well, I think the average RBC ratio is 700%, right? So the people hold seven times more capital than they say you need because you mentioned rating agencies. The rating agencies actually are much more concerned with solvency than regulators. Regulators are concerned with where, you know, I started my comments, they're concerned with fairness. They're concerned that the premium I'm charging different risks is commensurate with the risk that they bring to the organization, and there's no unfair discrimination and all, all that sort of thing. So I think certainly in the U.S., I would say regulators seem to be much more concerned with the sort of fairness and the pricing side of things. I think in Europe it's different with solvency too. The capital margins are much lower there, and rating agencies are concerned with solvency. And I think that's actually been a problem because hmm. – the rating agency's incentive is not to be wrong, not to say this is a solvent company and then have it become insolvent. And what does that lead them to do? It leads them to be very, very conservative. And that's why you know, they have these very, you could argue, I would argue, very onerous uh, cat charges, right? So AM Best, S&P typically have a sort of stress test mentality. Not only do they want you to be able to pay a one in a hundred loss, they basically want you to be able to continue writing business with no change in your plan after that loss. Well, that's a very different standard from a solvency standard, which would simply be, I just want you to be able to pay the one in a hundred loss. And they just decided to do that on their own recognizance, right? And that has driven a big increase in capital need. And it interests me that no one has picked up on Yo, who gave these rating agencies the right to, to drive such high capital requirements into insurance companies? And is that actually in the insured's ultimate best interest? You know, I love that characterization, Steve. I saw that you made that. You guys made that in the book uh, where you mentioned uh, how the, the you know certain rating agencies demand this incredibly high standard, whereas uh, uh, – you mentioned regulators. I don't know that you mentioned regulators. You mentioned a competitor to S&P and AMBS being Demotech. And Joe Petrelli has been a guest on the show a couple of times. And I think Demotechs are an underrated, if I may use that pun, organization because they are they are at the very least introducing some competition into that business. I mean, you know, not everybody not everybody uh, uh, appreciates Demotech the way that I think that I do or I want to. 
Um, but man, at least it's a different perspective for crying out loud. And they do have a little bit more of this, you know, we're going to make sure that you can pay claims kind of uh, approach. And isn't that what we want? Right. But there's a debate because if you talk to, and I'd like, I do agents all the time, insurance agents, you know, they tend to be concerned with stability of relationships saying, I don't want to have to go to, to, to a new company every year because I'm used to, you know, in a lot of ways, the margin of an insurance agency is built around not having to touch the business very much. Um, so you kind of set it and forget it, as people like to say. And even not even customers don't really want to touch the business. They want to buy it from an insurance company and they want to just not have to worry about insurance ever again, please. Um, so you could say, you could see, make an argument there that AM Best is doing more or less what the customer wants, even though that's not really what the regulator's concern about is just making sure everybody gets their claims paid. I think you're stretching a little. I think the customer wants to pay as little as possible for solvent insurance, and you're not giving them a choice. I think you're right. Sure. Democheck has introduced a choice, right? Um, and I think that's good. I, I think people were not asked, so would you rather have, you know, that your insurance company can survive this, pay your claims and continue, versus you pay less for insurance and you might have to shop if they – if they pay your claims, but they can't continue as a going concern. No one was yeah. asked that. No. Um, and yet you have the reinsurance business, which is which has no equivalent to that. Well, I mean, I guess they do. They, we have the collateralized markets, right? So in the reinsurance business, the alternative to AM Best is nothing. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like a bank account. Uh, uh, maybe, John, you want to talk a bit about that, you know, uh, about maybe how collateralized reinsurance works for a second because you were there at the very beginning. Um, and as an alternative to AM Best, uh, what do you th any any kind of reaction to that? Yeah, it's uh, it's all about having the money to pay your claims. Uh, if you're you're running a leveraged business, you've got uh, exposures, big multiple of your assets, uh, but you've got a low probability that uh, that you're going to blow through that. But if you want to be absolutely sure, then you limit your exposure to a certain amount and you fund every last dollar of it, and then the, the question of solvency just doesn't arise, you know, uh, unless somebody, you know, unless you're, you know, unless you have problems with your counterparties on your asset side, the money's going to be there, and there you go. Which has happened. Which happened, right, after, uh, you know, when the Lehman, Lehman blew up, they blew up some cap bonds because of what they were doing on the, the asset side. So, yeah. and the other thing, though, again, we go back to with collateralized, it works for property, because there's no reserves. And it doesn't work for casualty. Casualty is once again different because of reserves. Mm. Yeah. And to me, the miracle of casualty reserves, so, you know, uh, and we can, you can listen to the Samir Shah podcast if you want like, some extensive treatment on this question, uh, but the you have to hold on to the money for a long time. And if you have to capitalize, you have to capitalize a company that just, right, so collateralized reinsurance, you buy a $100 policy, and it costs five dollars. They take your five dollars. They they put that with ninety five dollars of their money into a bank account, and now you have a hundred dollars for your limit in case the, a claim happens. Um, and so that is a you know you know at the point of sale, collateralized company. You don't need any rating agency because there's no chance of insolvency again, as long as the bank is good for it. And Lehman was not um, where they put the money with Lehman in the two thousand and eight crisis. Uh, but you can assume that away. Uh, and so you kind of have this you have this world where every contract has its own bank account. And if you have you have a claims reserve that lasts 25 years, that bank account's gotta keep the money in it for 25 years. <laughs> That's a long time. If you're looking for an annual return on that money, uh, uh, you can't really do that. You have to diversify that you know, radically against thousands and thousands of other bank accounts. So you're kind of only holding one. And so the amount of leverage you get is huge. Is that, you guys agree with all that characterization? Yeah, I mean and that- you add? brings up uh, something that I, I found interesting is in one of our later chapters on reserve risk. Um, and I think there's, so there's a number of places where the way, the way we do accounting for insurance sort of gets in the way of thinking about risk clearly. Because normally what accountants want to do is they want to match revenue and expense, right? And so, we we do that very simplistically because we have an unearned premium reserve, right? And we, we say, well, we've got this accident year. The events will happen in the accident year, so we own the premium proportional across the accident year. And when we get to the end of the year, if there's any unexpired term, you know, we roll that over. 
Hitler. And so that's, that's the extent of the matching that we do. But what we should really be doing is, and let's take the, you know, let's imagine we work at the, either zero interest rates or, or we've discounted everything. Actually, you shouldn't earn the premium across the year. You should earn the premium in the proportion that the risk is revealed to you. Okay? And it might well be that in the first year, you're writing excess casualty. I'm booking plan at the end of the year. There is zero variability about that. It's going to take me two or three years to know anything. Okay? And the, it, you, you, we tend as actuaries to conflate the emergence of information about a risk with the payment pattern. And we, we think that Interesting. You know, a long payment pattern means you know, that, that there's a sort of risk carries on for a long time. But you can have different situations that emerge there, right? You can have something like work comp where you maybe get into a periodic payment and an annuity type settlement. You're going to pay for a very long time, but you know very early on what the amount's going to be if it's indemnity. If it's medical, you probably don't because you've got medical inflation sitting there. And then you've got other risks where uh, actually the uncertainty exists for a very long time. If you've got some court case and it takes, you know, you're going through discovery and what have you, you actually, you're, you're pushing the resolution of your uncertainty out a very long time. And we don't really sort of get into this temporal aspects, <coughs> but they're very important uh, in terms of sort of decomposing that ultimate underwriting risk and allocating it back to the individual calendar years that you go through. Well, so I, I do want to say that we haven't yet covered maybe the most new sort of bit of jargon in the book for a practicing actuary, which is this concept of spectral risk measures. Um, certainly was, you know, I, I didn't, hadn't come across that terminology until I started hanging out with Steve Mildenhall. Um, and uh, I, so I'd like you to just maybe talk to about us about what those are. What is a, what is the is spectral I think a spectral is like Ghostbusters, like the specter, which is like, a, or maybe a James Bond villain, um, but it means some, something else. Um, but I can't help but think about Ghostbusters when we talk about spectral misreasures. That's probably what we're talking about. I don't know, Steve, maybe you can give us a little bit of kind of background on these and, and tell us a little bit about where they came from. Sure, sure. So the, John mentioned this uh, Yari paper jewel, a different way of thinking about um, utility. Rather than adjust the outcomes, you adjust the probabilities, Okay. And that's really what the, the fundamental thing of a spectral risk measure. It is a consistent way of adjusting probabilities. And what you're going to do is you're going to make the bad outcomes more likely and the good outcomes less likely. And then you're just going to use those adjusted probabilities, take expected values. It's going to increase the mean, and you call that a risk-loaded premium. Right? That, that's sort of the idea. And what's interesting about that fairly simple-sounding uh, uh, concept is if you trace it back, it's throughout the literature in a number of different domains. So the Yari paper was 1987. Uh, there was a very famous book by a guy called Peter Huber called Robust Statistics that basically had the definition of coherent risk, theory, risk measures in it from a sort of statistical robustness estimation process uh, perspective. That was published in 81. Uh, the idea of adjusting probabilities to price goes back to sort of no arbitrage pricing, Black Shoals in 1973. And then if you go all the way back and you just look at it from a mathematical perspective, there's a French mathematician called Gustave Choquet, and he published his paper on what were called capacities at the time in 1954, right? So <laughs> these ideas are, you can tell it's an important idea because it emerges over and over again in different uh, areas of the literature. So I'll, I'll let John talk about sort of the, the move forward from, from Yari and, and kind of what we did with it. The the uh, as we said, uh, it's not a lot that's new and original in the book. We're we're distilling what's already there, but I, I would like to highlight something that is original in the book, and that is uh, Steve's uh, what I call the envelope theorem. Uh, he wrote a paper uh, called "Similar Risks Get Similar Prices," and uh, part of that is summarized in the book. And the, the basic idea here is: let's say let's say I've got a portfolio. And I've got a, a, a price for the portfolio, a margin for the portfolio. And I want to allocate that down to the, the, the policies or the lines of business or whatever. Now, if you have a, a spectral risk measure, a particular distortion function, of course, you can do that. You apply the methods in the book. But what if you don't know your distortion function? What if you, all you know is I want to use a spectral risk measure to do that? 
but I don't know which one it is. Uh, now, out of all the possible spectral risk measures, they're not all going to work because they're not all going to give the right price to the portfolio. So there's a certain number of them, an infinite number of them, that will give you the right price to the portfolio. Well, it turns out that you can identify the extreme ones among that infinite set, and you can examine them systematically and come up with bounds on what the prices on your components are going to be. I, you know, I have a particular single line of business here I want to price, and I can come up with the lowest possible price and the highest possible price among all of those spectral risk measures that will price the portfolio at, at this expected amount. Now, that doesn't sound like a big deal. It's like, well, you know, of course, you know, uh, of course you can, you know, do that theoretically. But the, but <laughs> the fact is you can do it practically, that there's a practical way to approach that. It's not computationally particularly onerous. And, and that's amazing to me that, that you can do that. And so, you know, that, that's featured in part of the book. And that is something new. Yeah, that, that, it, it sounds like something that, uh, you know, of course, you know, theoretically, we can go through all of the possibilities and, and there's going to be a maximum, there's going to be a minimum, you know, that's just calculus. Uh, but the, but it's, it's more than just a theoretical result. It turns out that there's a practical way to do that, that you can, you know, a computationally efficient way to do that, to find the maximum and the minimum uh, pricing for every component of your portfolio, knowing only that it is a spectral risk measure and it's pricing the whole portfolio a certain way. Uh, and that just blew me away, and I'm, I'm just you know, so so happy to have <laughs> understood how that works. Uh, the, the paper is, uh, of course, uh, an academic paper, and it has to be written to a certain level of sophistication. Uh, so it, it uh, you know, maybe you want to start with the book uh, as, as an, ex an explanation for that. But the other the other point is that uh, that's if you know nothing about the measure uh, except for the total portfolio price. Now, what if you know a little bit about that? What if you know a part of the distortion function, you know, say up in the uh, the high tail area where uh, business is, is being bought and sold and that you have some market information, but you don't know the rest of it. What do you do then? Well, we're working on that now. We're, we're busting that, that problem wide open. And uh, uh, I, I'm hoping that'll be part of uh, volume two or, or at least a paper. Well, well, so and what is the insight? Just add on, on that, at the, at the same time, I've been using this in practice and it works and it's useful. And, and people, I think, you know, they got a lot out of being able to see the ranges. They were able to make sort of selections from this. So it was very helpful to be able to quantify uh, what that range was and identify the, the components of it. You know, that raises an interesting point, one I wanted to touch on, um, which is, you know, the book itself is tremendously practical, tremendously practical. I mean, there are a lot of very concrete examples that, exercises you work through uh, uh, that I didn't work through, <laughs> but then I'm not studying for the exam that this one day will be on the syllabus for, um, uh, you know, maybe my kids. Uh, so, that, and I also want to put a plug in for something we'll put a link to, which is a YouTube channel. There was a talk that you guys were a part of um, and he called uh, ERM Diner. I think you call it, John, we'll put a link up to that. I found those really interesting and there's spreadsheets. Um, which I don't know if there's a spreadsheet. I don't know if I have access to that, but we'll make sure there's a link to a spreadsheet that you can, if you want to, walk through that series of talks and follow along with examples. Um, uh, you know, for people who want to actually use this stuff, this is a tremendously practical application. Uh, I want to come a little bit, talk a bit more about kind of the book itself. Uh, but before that, I do want to kind of finish this thought on that, uh, as you're calling it, John, envelope theorem. Uh, Steve, what is the insight that underlies the ability to determine bounds for spectral measures, uh, arbitrary spectral measures of understanding it right, uh, about what they might mean for the price of a, of a, of a risky process or an asset? Um, well, it, go, it goes back to, we, we've, we've mentioned the word coherent several times, and there's, there's axioms for, for coherence. But one of the key axioms is convexity. And convexity means, you know, something is, if you draw, join two points in the space, the whole line lives in the space. And you really want functions to be convex. They are very well behaved if they're convex. And in particular, if you've got a convex function, a local maximum is a global maximum. And so if you're going to do optimization, you really want to optimize against a convex uh, function. And the, the uh, envelope theorem is, is really just a uh, corollary of the fact that you can see a certain uh, space has to be convex 
and then you can identify the corners of it basically and that gives you all the points that you need i see so let me, let me add let me add you asked what's the fundamental that's underlying it and the answer to that is tvar okay spectral risk measures are composed of tvars and yep. the extremes are very simple combinations of tvars yes tvar tail value at risk this is above a certain threshold which you determine for the tvar you take the average of all the events above that threshold right the tail value yep. at risk um, now, I have a problem with T-Bar, guys, since we're on it now. You brought it up. Uh, <laughs> that I wanted to talk to you a little bit about. Because it really it comes with an, to an interaction between, I think, the assumptions of this book, uh, which is, uh, you know, we're assuming the pricing is fixed. Like, sorry, not the pricing is fixed. We understand the expected loss, right? We are assuming that this distribution we've chosen is right. Uh, that said, the tail of all these cat model distributions are freaking made up. <laughs> I mean, you might have one event that's kind of near the tail somewhere that you have some real data on in the last 100 or 200 years, but everything else are just like perturbations about event. Uh, you know, so for example, the one that I studied most closely in my career was uh, the the hurricane that hit Long Island, right? Which was a big of a cat four, I think they called Long Island Express, 1936, something like that. And then pretty much every really bad event uh, in the in the models, the vendor models, RMS, AAR, um, are you know, variations on mostly that, a big, strong storm, which, and if you study the specifics of the history, is kind of really unusual in lots of ways. You have two lows, and things just sort of shot through it really fast, so it stayed really strong, really late, you know, all kinds of weird things, and that's just, you know, tail events are going to be weird. But and you kind of take that and then and other events which were not nearly as serious, and you're just kind of playing with the assumptions in those events. You are inventing events, right? So you are taking, you know, to calibrate a TVAR for a spectral risk measure, you have to assume the distribution is correct. But the distribution contains a buttload of assumptions in it. And so I would say like, you know, if we're dealing with only TVARs, we're kind of like, I, th I don't know, you guys can push back what you think, like, you know, the, the sort of taking that as a, as a given is, is um, a little tricky. Well, you know, the mean is a TVAR too. You know, there's TVARs across, across the whole... <laughs> Across the whole spectrum. You, you, Attaching you know, at zero, yes, good. Yeah, we're, we're, you know, we're talking about every spectral risk measure is a weighted sum of T-bars. That doesn't mean they're all 99.5 T-bars. i got two points, if I could, on this. What, Please. One is, I think your characterization of cat models there is, is quite misleading, right? Okay. The, the reason that, so the cat, you've got these global climate models generate millions of events, not just Hurricane of 38, we had 36, whatever it was, millions of events, right? Based in physics, atmospheric physics and what have you. Okay, so I think you've got a pretty good spread of events. The reason that it's always New York is you've been to, you live in New York. There's a giant concentration of values there, right? It's yeah. always going to be in New York. I don't know how much value there is on Manhattan, but it's probably, you know, it's, it's just it's a very big number. Right? <laughs> very, it's very big always number. always going to be New York, okay? And then, yeah. you know, maybe it'll be Houston, it'll be Miami. But for, it's like, I don't know if you remember when, when terrorism models came out, the problem you always had was you couldn't get a rate, rounded rate that was greater than zero outside Manhattan because there's just so much value there and it's so close together. So, so that, that's the first point. The second point it is John's, John's excellent reminder to us that the, the mean is a T-bar as well. And one of the things that I've gotten, you know, I like to listen to senior, when you listen to like a, on conference calls and things, what CEOs talk about risk, they're always talking about risk across the spectrum. And the spectral of spectral risk measure is, is kind of the probability level, right? So is it a, a one in a hundred lost 99th percentile or is it a median lost 50th percentile or is it really good outcomes, 10th percentile? The spectral risk measure is giving you your view of sort of how... A, painful risks are, are to you across the spectrum. And there's a lot of, when you get into capital allocation work, what tends to happen is you go, don't care, don't care, don't care, don't care, up to some threshold, care massively, and that's it, right? And, and what spectral risk measures do is they give you the ability to be much more nuanced about that and to say, no, I care about all the losses. I care about even the ones that are better than that. I just don't care about them so much. So rather than having a, a caring function that goes, don't get any old, care a lot, is a gradually increasing thing. And, and spectral risk measures give you a consistent, broad set of families to do that, that allow you to express much more nuanced risk appetites than all or nothing. Okay, so that reminds me actually um, about something that I promised 
our audience and myself we would touch on, which is Del Bain's Del Bean. I, I, do you know how to pronounce his name? Freddie? I'm Freddie. I don't. <laughs> our boy Freddie. Uh, so he wrote this tremendous paper, uh, tremendous in all sorts of ways, um, um, unbelievably dense paper uh, uh, that uh, I don't understand. Um, and, you know, even, <laughs> so, you know, even took a man as great as Steve Milton Hall 20 years to figure it out. Uh, but, like, so explain it to me, Steve. Like, he figured something out a long time ago that took the industry a heck of a long time to digest and understand the consequences of what is it that he understood? So he uh, was one of the co-authors in a paper that I think came out in 1997 called Thinking Coherently. Yeah. And it introduced the axioms for a coherent risk measures. And the, and the idea was they said, okay, we're trying to measure risk. There should be certain things that we can agree on about risk. And let's write those down as axioms. And, and they were basically um, – a pool is less risky than the sum of the parts. Seems reasonable, right? You've got some diversification going on. Um, if a, a certain risk is less than a certain other risk in every state of the world, then the, the risk measure should be less, right? It's called mo monotonic. Um, if you add a constant to a risk, you're just like translating it. There's nothing else going on there. Uh, and if you scale a risk, the risk scales, right? And that one is a bit dubious, but, you know, let, let's spot that. So you've got these four axioms, and they, they define what's called a coherent risk measure. And what Delbane's paper then does is it says, all right, these are exactly all of the coherent risk measures, right? It, it characterizes them. And the way it characterizes them, it says, they're all characterized as the worst risk-adjusted expected outcome, where the risk adjustment, which is a way of adjusting your objective probabilities, lives in a certain convex set, okay? So that is your characterization of all coherent risk measures. And, and basically, everything follows from there. And as John said, the sort of fundamental building block is they're all T-vars anyway, so it's all about different weighting functions on T-vars, and it's a matter of how you come up with the, the weights. And there's, so, one, there's one kind of um, part of the paper where he talks about whether uh, some scenarios exist and if something exists, then the marginal contribution of a risk to the whole is calculable. Am I understanding that right? The, if I even phrasing that question right? Um, I'm not sure from that description. I'm so it's a Q with like a shadow on it, as I'm going to be very specific and the, embarrass myself the Q's, here. Yeah, the Q's like are a your, Q. So P's and Q's. P is your objective probability. Q is your risk adjusted probability. Okay, and I think it's like Q of Y or something, or negative Q of Y. And if this if this exists, and there's ways multiple ways for it to exist. Um, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's 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 it. That's the, that's the, okay. So what that's about is is it saying for for any so you've got your spectral risk measure. Um, you it is a risk adjusted expected value, right? And the risk adjustment is your Q. It's this set of adjusted probabilities. Uh -huh. The the key result is if there's only one way of coming up with those risk adjustments, then everything works. And in particular, the risk adjusted probability method and the marginal method goes all the way back to you know Bayes Reed marginal method. Everyone likes marginal methods. They are the same, hmm. but if there are multiple ways of doing the risk adjustment, then they are different. And what's going on there is, is basically you've got a flat spot in your outcome. So if you think about TIVA, let's say you're looking at 90, 99% TIVA. If your uh, outcome distribution had, takes the same values, say, between the 98th and a half and the 99th and a half percentile, so you've got a little flat spot, then it's not obvious what the worst 1% of outcomes is, ah, right? Okay. It could, you've, it, you've got a choice. You've got a 1% band, and you've got to pick half a percent of it. And you can do that in a lot of different ways. Now, just because your total is constant doesn't mean that each of the lines, the units that go into that total are going to be constant. So it really matters which half a percent you pick, right? And that is the reason why the allocation is not unique. And depending on which part you pick, you get different allocations, it, it, it counts for all the order uncertain, you know, ordering problem, um, and it, it accounts for, you know, if you grow or shrink, you get different answers and everything. And it basically boils down to the fact that there's no unique derivative. You've got a function that looks like this. And if you approach it from this way, you think the slope's here. And if you approach it from this way, you think the slope's here. And you've got a whole range of slopes that correspond to picking different half a percent bands out of that 1% flat spot. And that's so what that makes... Ah, and that was really only appreciated like 
in the early 2000s, after, you know, Delvane had the paper, but the, the characterization of it essentially goes back to no flat spots was a couple of other papers that were in the early 2000s. And uh, there's quite a bit of ink spilled in the book uh, detailing this phenomenon. Yes, this is hopefully some diagrams that make this clear and, and what have you, yeah. So, so I, I get the problem. What's the solution, the resolution to the problem? So, like, if you approach it from different sides, the slope looks different. Um, how do you handle that? So, so we offer two <laughs> solutions to that problem. One is the reason you've got a flat spot is generally because you've got something like uh, your, uh, you've got a default situation, so you can only pay the losses, you know, you can only pay up to the assets you have, or maybe you've got, like, an, an aggregate stop. You've got a layer of reinsurance. Okay. And it, it causes your outcomes to always be constant. But in, it, it is often the case that you can look through that. You can say, ah, oh, actually, there's this sort of unlimited random variable sitting out there that has no flat spots, and that determines a unique ordering on all events. Because the key thing here is to rank all of your outcomes from worst to best. That's the key yeah. thing that you've always got to do. And when you've got ties, you've got a problem, right? How do I order within the ties? That, that is what drives the problem. So if you can go... If you can lift it, we call it the lifted allocation. If you can go back to a, a sort of bigger risk, like a gross risk that doesn't have a flat spot, you use that and you get rid of the problem. So that's it one solution. Time. The other solution is essentially that you just average all the ways you can permute in the flat spot. And that's Interesting. called the linear uh, natural allocation. Those are the two uh, solutions that we have. Um, so I like about that, but the first one, second one, I'm not sure I like, but the first one, um, it's because you're using real insurance knowledge. You're, you're yes. looking at that and you're saying, something's going on here that's real. So this is not just a mathematical weird anomaly. It's not like, you know, I don't know. This is not some strange function that that, uh, that behaves strangely. No, no, no. It's because we put an aggregate stop loss on the thing. Yeah. And so there's like a real trigger for this. We just got to go back to the assumptions or not the assumptions, but the, I don't know, the, 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 the components of the model. And then we can get some insight from there. That's great. When, when it's available, you can do that. Yeah. 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 It's not, the, the, not always the, available. The, the bummer here is is that if you are a limited liability insurance company, which all insurance companies are, right, they have a finite amount of assets, you always have a flat spot if you have the possibility of default, which you basically always do. So yeah. essentially the marginal method never, <laughs> never really works. You have to do something to get around it. Okay. So, guys, let's talk about the book. So, the, the, so here it is. Um, I have a copy too, of course, uh, which I was very pleased to get in the mail because I got a PDF copy. This is way better. Um, how long did it take? How did you guys start it? Uh, what on earth would possess you to write a, uh, let's do a quick check here, 500 something page book of math? No, I'll start it with it. Don Mango. Okay. Yeah, Don I was, Mark. I was. As I mentioned before, I was working with him, refining the capital tranching concepts. And, uh, you know, we got to the point where uh, he thought uh, this would this would be a great thing to show at a CAS conference. And uh, he wrote Steve in. He thought, you know, there's another guy who would be really good for this. Let's bring Steve Mildenhall in. And so we did. And uh, what, what was it like from, from your end, Steve? I had actually met Steve years earlier at an NBER meeting, but since we were both uh, working for competitors, it was kind of an arm's length, uh, hi, how are you doing? Uh, yeah. Whereas, yeah until, and, until 2016, so I worked for Aon, Aon Benfield, and John was working for a guy cup. So I used to keep a very careful eye on exactly what they did and and uh, basically look for holes in it because, you know, it was, a, it was a competitive issue. So I remember John being fairly frosty at that meeting. And uh, <laughs> uh, But by 2016, I had moved to St. John, so I was now neutral territory. And, yeah, I remember Don, you know, giving me a call saying um, that they, they had a, a spot on this team that wanted to do this. And I had been already sort of toying around. I, I, I have a manuscript, I think, that goes back to about 2012, for a, for a monograph that was called All About Capital that was basically a precursor to this book. So mm -hmm. I've been thinking about, you know, wanting to write this stuff up. And, and when I moved to academia, one of the things I was keen to do was, you know, let, let me try and find the answer that I'm sure exists in the literature and, and spend the time on it. So it was great to, you know, it was an incredibly productive collaboration with John. Um, we used GitHub to, you know, share files back and forth. I just looked up and the book took 
1,200. Well, so the, the, well, let's talk about the meeting. Let's talk about the meeting. Yeah, this, this was a, a multiple-day session. It wasn't just an hour. This was multiple hours presenting at CS. It was a deep dive. It was called uh, the, 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 the Most Important Risk Measures You Never Heard Of. And it was, uh, you know, our inter introducing spectral risk measures to, to the audience. And, and the videos that you alluded to were made of that, of that uh, couple of days there. Uh, and so we came out of that and went, wow, you know, that went pretty well. And, you know, maybe we should write this up. And the, the first idea was, uh, you know, maybe a monograph, you know, maybe, maybe a CAS monograph, about 100 pages. That ought to do it. And, uh, but, you know, Steve had bigger ideas. <laughs> Hey, what yeah. was the bigger idea? Like, why, why, why? Go everything you want to know about capital. <laughs> yes, <Yeah. risk. laughs> I, I wanted the stuff at the beginning about risk measures because yeah. that's not well covered in the syllabus. Um, I, I wanted the history that we've talked about a little bit. You know, the Wang papers, the Phillips, the Myers Cohen, Myers Reed, all that stuff to give the context. And there's just a lot of stuff here. When you when you're going to go through the details, you know, we, we've we've structured it around. It's a sort of basically three parts. Part one is, is risk measures. Part two is pricing a portfolio. It's coming up with that total cost. And then part three is allocation. There is a part four of miscellaneous other topics. And then within each part, we divide it into what we call the classical period, which is up until 97, which was you know Wang's layering paper, the Phillips coming as an Allen paper on uh, multi-line pricing, and the, the coherent risk theory paper. So that's a nice dividing line. So we do the classical, the way we used to think about it, theory, and then how that worked in practice. And then we do the new, the modern approach, both in theory and practice. So there's sort of four subsections in both one for portfolio and one for, for allocation. Now, I th this is right. I think, Steve, you've bragged to me about how this is all contained in like a IPython notebook or something like that, where you can generate all the graphs and stuff humongous number of graphs and you know all these examples right so this is all stuff you've had to invent uh right yeah i have a package called aggregate that um i use to generate all the examples in the book and, and frankly I, I actually used it more to to understand the theory i, I okay. spend countless hours just computing things and looking at them and trying to understand what's going on i mean the, the question about all right, so you take a cat line and a non-cat line, and you pull them together, and most of the diversification benefit goes to the non-cat line. Well, why? Why does that happen? I've spent you know a lot of time thinking about that. I think we've got to a good place in in the book, sort of, to answer that. And, and, and you know, the answer is, yeah, it, it does partly because the cat drives the tail, and the tail is expensive, as we've discussed. But the degree to it actually varies with with your risk tolerance and your risk appetite and, and you can charge more or less the the non-cat line so um yeah cr creating the software was a, a big part of that i'm, I'm currently working on uh, writing that up I'm, i hope to release that uh, before the end of the year and maybe get people use it so they will for example be able to reproduce a complete set of the exhibits for the we've got four case studies we run through the book uh each with two, two lines it's, it's always a, a less volatile line and a more volatile line so sort of fairly simple, but a, a lot of fairly sophisticated um, exhibits, and you'll be able to reproduce all of those for, for the book case studies and for your own case studies using the software once it gets released. And I, and I, I love, I, I worry a little bit about something with this book, which is that it's inevitably some chunk of this, maybe tons of chunks of it are going to wind up on the CAS syllabus, um, and that's going to be great. Uh, for for you know the future of humanity, <laughs> let's call it. So this is good, uh, but I I wonder whether the history is going to do it because the history is great. I mean, you guys have, and I I think we don't have enough of a sense of history in this business where we don't think hard enough about the alternate universes that already existed uh, in the previous decades when you had different kind of regulatory regimes, things that all could happen again, or in some way or another, right? So to learn the history, I think, is such an important thing. And uh, I don't think we do quite enough of that, except on one of the exams in the, in the actual syllabus where they talk about the history of regulation, which was my favorite uh, part of the whole thing. We used to be exam six anyway when I took it. Um, and uh, so I love the history. I hope, you know, people continue to study it um, and and also kind of understand the, the we can honor the names of the people who did who discovered this stuff. We don't have enough, I think, enough of a pantheon either in our business. Um, and maybe you can take a moment to sort of talk a little bit about that. I mean, who are the who are the 
the, the, the people you would thank. I mean, some of them have passed on that we all talked about, Don. Um, but are there other people that you know we want to celebrate that contributed to this? You wanted to mention Glenn, didn't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I was just wondering if you wanted to go first, um, but I'm happy to, to to jump in. So, um, I mean, the, the history part of it to me is this has been my career. Like right? this has been my my professional life has been figuring this stuff out. I've been thinking about risk basically since day one. I remember, you know, very early on, I was worked on the allocation of charges across state and line when I was in personal lines at uh, CNA. Um, We've mentioned quite a few people, you know, Sean Wang, obviously hugely important. The people that I interacted with at the Risk Theory Seminar, so David Cummins was there, Jim Garvin, you know, Steve Darcy, um, but, and, and then Richard Derrick I've mentioned a few times from, from the AIB. The, the one thing that hasn't come up so far that was just really, really important for me is uh, Glenn Myers, who strangely didn't work for a reinsurance broker, is outside that loop, but I, through talking with Glenn and through reading his papers, sort of informed how I think about modeling insurance risk and how you factor the uncertainty uh, components into it, how you think economically, you know, marginal cost and margin revenue kind of um, ideas. So he, he was just, just hugely influential in this. And it was through those discussions that it was immediately apparent to me when I read the Myers-Reed paper, oh, they've made this homogeneous assumption. Well, that's not how it works, right? You don't grow by scaling up. You grow by adding new independent or largely independent insureds to your portfolio so the distribution changes shape. You know, Glenn Myers would never have made that assumption because it's just simply not how insurance works. And if, if you've been sort of trained to think the way he thought, it, it, it was just obviously not the right way to do it. I, I, can I just make one point, and then John, I want to get your reaction to this same kind of topic. But the 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 concept of you having personal relationships with people and conversations with people, right, as informing your intuition, I think is easily overlooked. Actuaries, we can talk about sort of the the, the culture of the business. Um, you know, one of the things I noticed that's different about actuaries early on in their exam taking process and the people who make it out the other end is the ones who make it out the other end are, are much, if I can just put it this way, more fun to hang out with, <laughs> um, or they, you know, they're just, there's a sociability, I think about succeeding in anything in life and including being an actuary, I think of it as a mathematical profession. It is that of course, but you know, the intuition that you developed that allowed you to real make real contributions and actually see straight through uh, a very high status pair of people putting a paper out to have flaws in their assumptions based on the conversations you had with a mentor of yours. I want to emphasize that. How did you meet Glenn? How do you, how did you come to have these conversations? I didn't have the conversations like this early in my career. Uh, what did you do that I did wrong? <laughs> that I didn't do. So I, 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 um, I shudder to think how obnoxious I was at the time, but, and I heard Glenn <laughs> telling this story to someone else and I'm not sure if he knew I was, I was with an earshot, but he said, you know, he was at, I, it was at the, a Boston CAS meeting, I think in 95, when I got my fellowship. And I read his stuff, and I knew who he was, and I was like, I had a question for him. And I just went up to him, and I asked him. I can't even remember what it was. <laughs> it's just like, so you say, blah, blah, blah. Well, what about this? And, you know, and he was great. I think, you know, I think all researchers love it when people read their material. And he, he is all about the problem solving. And he just says, oh, let me, you know, in his Glenn way, let me explain to you how that all works. And it was fantastic. I, I, I just learned so much from him. He was great. John, how about you? Oh, I was fortunate enough to be working alongside and for some, some real superstars there, uh, you know, Gary Venter, Rodney Kreps. Uh, and then they would, they would, in turn, would go and bring in people as consultants like Sean Wang and, and Ken Fruit, and I got to interact with them. So I just lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time to, to interact with these people. Yeah, but, uh, and so many, so many things are, I guess. Um, it, so let's kind of close on this sort of concept of what are so what can people do to help the next kind of level of this cause, you know, like what are some, what are some interesting problems that are outstanding? Um, what, what advice would you give, let's say, you know, the earlier version of yourself, you know, what, what, where should they go? What's the next level of development? What, what would you do if you were 24 years old, 25 years old and looking for cool things to work on? Cause it ain't done. Right. Yeah. 
And this may not be exactly what you were looking for, but I, I think at this point uh, we've kind of pulled the curtain back on this new way of looking at things, and it, it need, we need people to start playing with it and using it and, and kicking the tires and, and seeing how you can apply it profitably and, and, and what kind of problems you can get into if you're, if you're abusing it. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to try and talk about what theoretical directions or, or new development needs to be done. I think, uh, I think it's implementation is the, is the next question. Now let's, let's have a revolution and, overturn the the way things have been done let's let's sweep away this notion of allocating capital and applying a constant cost of capital rate to it and let's let's start thinking this new way and seeing if we can actually make it work yeah i guess I, i'd add um risk is subjective and the theory is trying to model the sort of reality that emerges in the market um and this actually reminds me of, I, I remember talking with, with Richard Derrick about one of the, the big company in uh, Massachusetts who, you know, they had the dominant market share. And I'm like, man, yo, I wish I was inside there. They, they clearly know what they're doing. And Richard just looked at me and he said, what makes you think they know what they're doing? They're just as in the dark as anyone else. <laughs> so you, I, actuaries tend to be sort of strong Bayesians, and they often go in with these sort of theoretical prejudices. And I think we've got to remember that the theory follows the practice. It's trying to model a reality that exists outside the theory, and you learn so much from that by listening to what people say and watching what they do, and particularly senior people, right? Because it's, Joe actually isn't going to change the direction of the company. But if a CEO of a big insurance company decides, or so the senior management decides they don't like cap risk, that's going to have a market impact. It's going to withdraw capital from it. The price is going to go up. So what they think and how they describe risk and what have you, you need to make sure that you've got a model of risk that can incorporate the types of things that they're saying. And don't go and think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I've done the exam in this. I know how this works, and that doesn't make any sense. Well, it doesn't matter whether it makes sense or not. It's going to drive the market. And if you're trying to model the market, you need to be able to incorporate it. So listening to what sort of you know, market participants say about risk op with an open mind and thinking about how to incorporate it into theory, I think, is, is a key to success in the future. Brilliant. And having a sense of history, uh, which you can get. Uh, from, among other things, the pricing insurance risk and also other work you guys have collaborated on, uh, which we've done podcasts on, Steve, of um, the history of the insurance marketplace. I mean, that's often a real good way to talk, communicate with folks about, you know, how does this fit into what happened? Um, we'll end it there, guys. My guest today, Steve Mildenhall, John Major, for the marathon, Not Unreasonable. I think probably coming in at two and a half hours or so. Their book, Pricing Insurance Risk. I loved it. Very proud to have done this with you fellas. Thank you very much. Thank you.